Okay. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Amay Agrawal. I am the founder of Skillslate Foundation, so, a non-profit organization working in education to, 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 to make education accessible to all. So, well, I really wanted to, to you know, ask you, whether you, all, you have joined uh, for this session. You. Uh, organized by COE India and Skillslate Foundation in association with Eon India and our academic partner GIMS. Uh, idea 2021. I would like to welcome all the participants on the YouTube and off the YouTube and all the other social media platform for this session. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this wonderful international conference and I'm sure that you are going to take a lot of learnings from it. Uh, I hand over to uh, Dr. Amita Moria, uh, the controller of examination from the Sage University, uh, who will be guiding us about how we will be proceeding with the session and what uh, all things you are going to learn and take away from our today's session. I welcome all the vice chancellors and the dignitaries present here for this session. Thank you so much. Over to you, Amitama. Thank you, Amem. Good morning to all excellencies, all dignitaries, guests, delegates, and participants. With great joy and immense exultation, I, Dr. Amitama Maurya, controller of examinations of Sage University, Bhopal, on behalf of Council of Examiners, India, and Skillslate Foundation Pune feel privileged to extend my warm welcome to all presented here for the inaugural function of International E-Conference on Examinations IDEA 2021, International Debate on Examinations and Assessments 2021. The examination is an ever evolving department called, often called the jewel crown in any university with voluminous contributions in testing the skills of the people. The conference will provide a forum to share and discuss ways to improve access to knowledge and promote academic and administrative collaborations. This conference is expected to bring in collaborative efforts and learning to interaction and academicians, examiners, corporates, university, and board administrators. The objective of this conference are to envision the examination reforms in higher education in India and abroad, to review the examinations in K-12 education sectors from the new normal, to evaluate the information and communication technology applications, to establish synchronism with India and abroad education policy, to compare and to review the international evaluation techniques, grading system, examination and mandate, and adopting to Indian ecosphere. During the conference, in all four days, the experts will be debating and expressing their views on the examination perspective in higher education, India and abroad, Indian national education policy for and against, examination in K-12 education sector, India and abroad, outcome-based education, critical issues and answers, information and communication technology, boon or bane, competency or research, argument, grading system should be universal or diversified, diversified system, and improving, improving students' experience through it is possible or it is not possible. Also, there will be two sponsored sessions by ION India on examination reforms. To move further, I would like to mention that patience, prayer, silence gives the strength to the soul. Therefore, I request you to be silent for two minutes and pray the Almighty to give us strength, courage, wisdom, hope, and peace.
Thank you all. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Raghavendra Venugopal, Professor and Controller of Examinations, Bennett University, Greater Noida, the Convener for Registrar Grid of India. He is also the Convener of Council of Examiners India and the Convener of this conference, IDEA 2021, to welcome the galaxy of the intellectuals and the dignitaries present here. So I request you to deliver the welcome address. Thank you, Dr. Ramita, for giving a good opportunity for me uh, to speak about COE India. Uh, COE India in an association to promote advanced scientific technologies in examinations and assessments. Established in, in the year 2019 and registered in 2021. It is the largest multidisciplinary professional body of exams encompassing multidirectional disciplines with an academic and corporate memberships over 300 uh, universities and and serving the nation for the qualitative and quantitative examinations and assessments. COE India has its quarters headquartered in Karnataka and has a national presence through centers, chapters, and organs. COE India continuously engages its stakeholders by training on examinations like weekly interaction in the name of week, word on education, examinations and knowledge, monthly symposiums like meal, monthly examination assess examinations, assessments, and learnings for all the COEs, quarterly commemorative sessions by name called RAISE, regional academic inputs on studies and examinations, national conventions like NEXT, National Examination Transformation, and international conference like IDEA, International Debate on Exams and Assessment. We have a proposal to introduce journal on exams and assessment soon. So I thank, uh, I take this opportunity to welcome our distinguished academic leader, leaders for this inaugural session. I, Raghavendran Venugopal, convener of the world's first international conference on exams and assessment, IDEA 2021. I have a honor to welcome you on behalf of COE India, Ion IDEA, SkillSlates India, to welcome you on the international debate of examinations and assessments. First and foremost, I welcome revered Vice Chancellor of Bennett University, Dr. Prabhu Agarwal, who has an exposure of both national and international academics and eminent <laughs> academic leader for this international conference. Welcome, sir, for this IDEA 2021. I welcome respected Vice Chancellor of Saito University, the International Conference. Welcome you, madam, for IDEA 2021. I also welcome distinguished Vice Chancellor of Hindustan Institute of Technology and Sciences, Deem TB University, Dr. Yasan Sridhara, who has a profound skill sets, skill sets on teaching pedagogy and research and outstanding academic leader for this international conference. Welcome you, sir, on behalf of IDEA 2021. I welcome eminent senior research fellow from Indian Council of Research, uh, Social uh, Science Research Center for Economic and and social studies, Dr. Malyadri Pacha, who has a weighty skill sets in research and superior academic leader for this international conference. Welcome, Dr. Gopal Krishna Joshi, executive director, Karnataka based education, and Solomon skill sets in teaching, an exceptional academic leader for this international conference. Welcome, you, sir for IDEA 2021. I also welcome our Dr. Ike but eminent vice chancellor of uh, former advisor of All India Council of Technical Education, advisor chairman of COE India and outstanding academic leader for this international conference. Welcome you, sir. And I also take a privilege to welcome Dr. Vinod Kumar Jain, prominent vice chancellor of Sage University Bhopal, known for his dynamic and remarkable academic leadership qualities for this international conference. Welcome you, sir. And I welcome our sponsors, Ion Idea, academic partners, institutional members of COE India, individual members of COE India, skill sets members, our audience members like professors, readers, teachers from and various administrators, and lastly, media members and partners for the COE India IDEA 2021. I welcome for IDEA 2021. It's a privilege to have you all on board on this conference and debate. On behalf of COE India and IDEA 2021, I also welcome Dr. Amita Maurya, 
co-convener and the master of conference. Thank you. And over to you, Dr. Ramita Monia for further things. Thank you. Hello. I mean, is all good? Sir, I'm not able to hear Amita, ma'am. If you can please continue with the session. I think Amita, ma'am, is facing some technical issue. Uh, sorry for the technical trouble within over three minutes. Yes, Tamita, ma'am, carry on. Sorry, sir. Actually, there was a delay because light was not there. I think it, my right. Wi-Fi connected. Okay, carry on, carry on. Okay. To move ahead, I am profusely, uh, profusely elated to take an opportunity to introduce Dr. Prabhu Agrawal. Dr. Prabhu Agrawal is working as Vice Chancellor at Bennett University, Greater Noida. He has earned BTEC in 1986 from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur in Mechanical Engineering. MBA in 1988 from Foster School of Business, University of Washington and PhD in 1991 in Production and Operations Management from Foster School of Business, University of Washington. Earlier, he served as president at NIIT University. He was founding vice chancellor of OP Jindal University. Apart from, his, he, apart from this, he also is the founder and president of EduServe Global Associates, New Delhi, India. He is providing consultancy and advisory services to various global clients in the areas of higher education, and process excellence across Asia, North America, and South America. His clients include Bank of America, Price Waterhouse, Dell Computers, Jay Jacobs, Department of Transportation, Virginia, is Uzuzu Motors, USA, Defense Contract Management Agency, USA, Brazilian Business School, Sao Paulo, ARI, Wisconsin, JSPL Group Companies, JSW Mumbai, 9.9 .9 Education Group, and small and mid-sized enterprises in India and abroad. During 2012 to 2018, he was Chief Learning Officer at Jindal Steel and Power Group Companies, New Delhi. And during 2007 to 2008, 2011, he was Assistant Dean in Executive and Professional Programs. College of William and Mary Mason School of Business, Williamsburg, Virginia, USA. He is eminent speaker and addresses in various, uh, he addressed in various recent forums on national education policy reform change, internationalization agendas in Indian universities yeah, conducted yeah, yeah. in August, 2020. Yeah, yeah. Reimagining and transforming the university Confluence of ideas during and beyond the COVID-19 disruption conducted by OP Jindal Global University in August 2020. Rethinking the role of research in teaching Harappa education, the Republic of Letters in June 2020. He has over 30 plus research publications after his doctoral research. His teaching interest includes logistic and supply chain management, business analytics and modeling operations research, operations for entrepreneurs, operations strategy, global operations, and international business case studies in operations strategy and project management. Please welcome Dr. Prabhu Agrawal for the presidential address. Over to you, sir. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, Dr. Moria. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible, sir. Thank you so much. Well, I <clears throat> want to take this opportunity to say good morning. And on behalf of uh, the Council of Examiners India, it is a privilege for me to be invited to be the presidential address speaker at this conference. I thank all our visitors on this panel, my colleagues, Dr. Bhatt, Dr. Sridhara, Dr. Guptan, Dr. Uh, Yogesh, Dr. Josi, Professor Pacha, and the conveners and the master of ceremonies. And a special thanks to Professor Venugopal, who has organized this as the convener, <clears throat> the IDEA 2021. You know, when I was wondering what to speak when I woke up this morning. So of course I have prepared texts and everything, talking points, so on and so forth. But I just could not think of a more appropriate topic being discussed at this time, at this place, under the current circumstances. Examinations. You know, I've, I have been subjected to the Indian education system in my youth, uh, K to 12 is all in India. Central Board of Secondary Education. And I remember the nightmares of class 10th and class 12th board exams. I, I also sat through the JE, the joint entrance exam, passed it somehow. Luckily, there were no coaching institutes in those times. There was no quota. Rajasthan, I mean, not quota, but quota Rajasthan kind of things. So I was spared being shipped out to quota Rajasthan. I was happy to live on campus in IIT Kanpur. My father was a professor there. So I grew up playing basketball, football, hockey, all the sports. But the nightmare of this exam used to sit on top of me. And the entire world would judge me how I did on one stupid exam, if I may take the liberty of saying it. Then I was fortunate to go abroad and I was subjected to an entirely different education system, which was essentially built around faculty and flexibility. And I would walk into a classroom and the professor would say, there is no exam in this class. There is no final exam. And I would like, what are you talking about? What am I gonna look forward to? Nope, there is no final exam. And some faculty member would come back and give me a, give me a paper in the first day of class and said, this is the final exam. You have to solve this problem over the course of the thing. So basically I started seeing a lot of flexibility. I bring, bring out these stories and then I became a faculty member. I was faculty from 1991 to 2011, full time at the Mason School of Business. And there was no controller of examinations of the type that we see here in India. It was up to me to decide what I want to do, what I want to do for assessments, what the percentages have to be, so on and so forth. The only, there were some constraints in the sense that I have to submit my grades on a particular date or before, that's it. Otherwise, I, I can't even tell you, I had lived on a campus for 20 years as a faculty member. I can't even tell you who the controller of examination was. So, and now I'm back in India since 2012. This is my fourth university, the founding vice chancellor of OP Jindal, uh, uh, and also uh, with 9.9 .9 education, and consultant to the National Rail Transport Institute, Baroda. 
president of NIAID University and now vice chancellor of, OP, of, of Bennett University. And suddenly I was thrust right back into that 1980s world that I was living in. And then us all got affected by the COVID pandemic. And right in the COVID pandemic, of course, as the leader of a university institution, a big deal is examinations. A big deal on admissions is examinations. We have all tried to adopt technology to somehow solve our problems. We know technology is not perfect. We don't know, the government doesn't know, the regulatory agencies don't know what to do today with examinations. I was reading a statistic that something like 17 students commit suicide every day in India because of pressure or performance in examinations. I've always looked at everything that's happened or a pandemic. And I say, well, there has to be a silver lining to this. There has to be something good coming out of this. Something as in, or, you know, things that are so static that never change, that take 40, 50, 60 years. A single event over the last one year has given us a window of opportunity to reimagine, rethink, Re, 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 uh, you know, re reinvent. We are also very fortunate that the national education policy that was launched uh, last year, NEP 2020, gives us maybe a larger framework to rethink education in general. But since you all are at COEs and examinations and are experts on it, I would ask you to step up, challenge yourselves, to debate beyond existing constructs, to ask yourself difficult questions, to ask yourself, what exactly is the role of an examination? Fundamentally, you can ask yourself a question, why have exams at all? The purpose of a university uh, is to provide a teaching, learning environment, career path, goals. So examinations have a very critical role today in education, very, very critical role. But you have to ask yourselves if examinations are leading to the outcomes that those examinations are meant to uh, satisfy. When there's a demand supply problem, examinations become a tool for selectivity. So all premier institutions worldwide use some form of an examination to basically not select somebody, but rather eliminate somebody. In universities, in higher education systems, we have evolved from a single exam at the end of the year to something called continuous evaluation, to something called midterms, but then also we have to have finals then we if somebody doesn't pass the final, then we have supplementaries, supplementaries, backlogs, and all that. It's a very complicated uh, ecosystem of examinations that we have created. The pressure of performance on the students, young kids, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, examinations should not be the reason that they have to commit or take the ultimate step in life. So I am... I am no expert on exams. I am sharing with you some of my experiences, thoughts. I'll also tell you that 
after I became a faculty member. I have never given a closed book exam in my life. I have taught for 20 years at the best universities in the world and every examination I tell students bring whatever resources you have to, to the exam. As long as the work that you're submitting is your own, I don't care where you copy paste from. I've given you two hours to answer five questions. If you want to find it on the Google network, whatever. I have never ever given a closed book exam. I see no value to it. So again, experiences of my own that I'm sharing with you. I hope some of these will reverberate and ring true for yourselves. Some of this you will absorb. Some of this you will agree with. Some of this I hope you disagree with. Rethink. And la lastly, the role of technology. Technology, I consider myself a dinosaur in the education industry. I have yet to teach an online class. But I somehow never got a chance. The pandemic has forced 80%, 90%, 100% of our faculty members to adopt. For some, for some of them, it is like sitting in front of a camera and talking to a screen. And for the students, it's likewise. Sitting in their beds or wherever they are, their cameras are off, listening to somebody talk on the other side. The only thing they look forward to on an online classes, examinations. If you tell them you're gonna have a quiz tomorrow, they will come. Otherwise, I don't think they even care. So the examinations are going to become extremely critical and how technology will facilitate this whole process of examinations in the online world. And let me tell you, we are not going to see the old normal come back to us. That normal is gone. There is no new, the new normal, nobody knows what it looks like. The world is moving online. The world is moving to a virtual platform, classrooms. So you have at this time an opportunity to discuss, debate, and, 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 and deliberate what technology can or cannot do for you. What should exams be? Should it be projects? Should you tell the student to go out there and do something interesting and then come back and submit a report, which is as original as possible? So challenge yourselves in your roles. I know today we have all these regulatory agencies that require us to do so many things where the controller of examinations plays such a vital critical part. Declaration of results and this and that, transparency, opening. So please, as experts on examinations, all of you are belong to the education or related industries. I, 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 I really think this is, this is what really needs to be rethought and debated and discussed. So once again, to this very interesting topic conference, and I thank the conveners and the organizers and all the eminent panelists, speakers, academicians, students who have joined this conference and I wish you all the best. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your enlightening words. Now, moving ahead, in an event of the global competitiveness, it is important that the graduates of Indian institutes and universities are as competent as, gra as, as competent as graduates of any other country in the world, not only in terms of scholastic achievements, but also in the terms of value system and richness in their personality. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce Professor Dr. Vinita Guptan. She is a visionary and strategic senior level admit academic leader with a natural propensity of high performance. She is currently the Vice Chancellor, Saito University College, Malaysia. She was previously the Dean of Taylor's Business School for 13 years. She expertly drives strategic aims across quality, sustainability, competitive advantage, revenue, research and enrollment. As a chartered accountant, she is also academically qualified with a doctorate and coupled with industry experience. Her views are both forward thinking and unconventional. As a, transpos as a transpersonal leader, she is authentic, ethical, and has a high degree of emotional intelligence, which is embedded in her leadership, and this has delivered significant positive impact. Her years of immersion in service learning and community engagement, focusing on diversity and inclusion, mainly in Southeast Asia, has given her an innate ability to engage with all key stakeholders. She has produced various impact reports for social enterprises and industry partners throughout the region and is currently working on projects in Myanmar and West Africa. Her career to date features various corporate engagements, research grants, awards, and publications, which reflects her professional credibility. She empowers and develops people through coaching, mentoring, and feedback, as well as capitalizes on individual and team diversity. While being committed to quality and takes a continuous improvement approach to all aspects of work, she excels at building productive partnership and strategic alliance. She effectively draws upon a vast skill set to deliver, achieve, and maintain the highest standard of work ethics while supporting the stakeholders and driving the utmost performance. As a vice chancellor, her achievements are extensive. Leading a university that predominantly serves the undeserved is aligned with her personal values and good teaching. Applied teaching and work integrated learning has now become the key tenets for the institution. She believes in impacting communities through education, and the university charges minimum fee and supports students to cope in this more digitally divided world. She diversified programs offering and established new and innovative schools to ensure students are prepared for the future. She is super heading hybrid programs for women enterprises and the indigenous communities. This is done with diversity and inclusion. This is done. She works with corporate and communities purposely to, to ensure seamless and broadless learning, which will impact the rural and marginal communities. She is instrumental for setting up the Center for Law Enforcement and Security Asia that that focuses on providing the latest insights, research, and professional development in the region. She has grown the professional education at the university and focused on broadening the unit's global visibility in support of organizational strategic aim and objective. Remit includes close collaboration work with the faculty to create new high quality management education programs development of enhanced educational opportunities for the workforce and advancement and dissemination of impactful and sustainable knowledge. She is highly skilled and an active researcher with particular interest in service learning leadership and corporate social responsibility with a focus on governance, diversity and inclusion. She is respected in the field of specialism <laughs> and has traveled sharing her knowledge as a speaker and presenter. She is committed to continual learning of self-evaluation. She has received numerous awards for her community engagement and service leadership work in the region. She is also a recipient of the Women Leadership Achievement Award and Humanitarian Award. 
some of the most noticeable engagement are at the UNEBAC Education, Business, Trade and Industry Association, Singapore, UMFCC, Yangao, Intellect, Intellectual Discourses in India, Malaysia, Korea, and holds adjunct and visiting roles both on locally and abroad. She is fellow of CMI UK and also served the treasurer, served as a treasurer regional board member of Chartered Management Institute Malaysia. She is also a member of various professional bodies. She is senior member of the International Economic Development Research and technical advisor of AKPK AFBES 2019 and advisor to the Counseling and Credit Management Agency, Malaysia. She contributes professionally as a member of Board of Advisors and sits on various committees in Australia, New Zealand Institute, Singapore. Singapore Institute of Supply Chain Management and Malaysian Institute of Corporate Governance. She serves as an external examiner and validator for various universities in the UK, India and Australia. Currently, she is a visiting professor at Myanmar Human Resource Institute. With equal pleasure, please welcome Professor Dr. Vinita Guptan for the keynote address. Thank you, um, Dr. Amita. Um, thank you for reading that whole thing out. Actually, you shouldn't have um, you know, used up the conference time to spend so much time reading it. But uh, thank you very much. Um, I also want to take uh, some time to uh, thank Dr. Raghavendra for inviting me onto uh, this platform and also to the uh, COE Council members for putting together such an impressive uh, lineup. And uh, I'm very certain that this is going to be a very successful event. And I am very humble to share my thoughts on this platform. So a uh, very good afternoon to everyone, uh, vice chancellors, uh, students, academics, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, welcome to my home. I think this is a wonderful opportunity because we get to invite people into our homes as we um, engage. And um, also I want to take uh, a minute to uh, acknowledge and thank uh, Dr. Agarwal for you know, setting a very wonderful tone for the uh, conference. And um, I think you, you, you spoke to the point and um, maybe yanked a few of my, my points out, but um, I, I really enjoyed listening. So thank you very much. And um, I'm just gonna spend the next uh, couple of minutes uh, talking about my experience in uh, being in education as well as sitting through um, controlled and standardized exams. So in, in Malaysia, the education system is not very different from India actually, uh, but I like Dr. Prabhu had the opportunity to study in other countries and uh, experience very different um, assessment methods. Uh, which I think it's very good. And um, I also have some very interesting um, points for why I think some standardized exams are actually quite good. But before I move on to that, I just wanted to start today because um, higher education is actually very close to my heart and I've been in it for a long time now. And with something that my mother told me as I went on to university, um, my mother, very, very wonderful lady, uh, never had the opportunity to go to university. But what she did was um, really worked very hard to, she's a single mother, worked very hard to put my brother and I through university. And as I went off to university, she, she was very clear to tell me that education is not only a tool for making money, it must be good for our hearts and our souls as well. And she 
was very clear to tell me that when you move on and study at university, it actually helps you figure out how you want to live your life, right? And actually what she knew also said was on top of that well-being that comes with, you know, going to university, doing, doing well, is it now gives you an opportunity to impact and serve others. And she was very clear that that must be my top priority. So she, uh, she said, you know, go on, go to university and learn, but be very clear don't just learn to pass your exams, but you must make learning purposeful. And I think those are the most powerful words that has impacted my life. And it has also paved my life. And um, I will always hold on to it. So it is amazing that my mother taught me to make learning purposeful. So over the years, I have always, always been impressed uh, with the wonderful teaching and learning initiatives that has changed global education. And uh, you know how academics uh, put in a lot of effort to make their classes exciting, to do things differently. But all that excitement sometimes does not translate into uh, different assessments. And I'm still constantly grappling with the policies and the requirements of various governing bodies, even in Malaysia, that require standardized examinations or a single high pressure, high graded um, examination, just either for modules, for courses, or even for the whole program. And sometimes professional uh, bodies put in a lot of pressure to have such examinations. And, um, you know, it, it, I do struggle uh, being in a leadership role to make such changes because there is an overarching uh, statutory and regulation that I have to follow. Um, so in my years of... Um, being in education, I actually have seen some very great successes with standardized and high pressured exams. And uh, I, I am a product of one of that. But on the flip side, I have also seen um, mental health issues rise. I have seen exceptional students leaving the education system completely because they have failed one exam or didn't perform as well. I have seen families traumatized and uh, depressed because they didn't meet a certain mark or a certain rank to get into a particular university or a particular program. And to me personally, that is a real waste because one examination or a series of examinations actually do not define um, an individual or how good you are. Personally, I have suffered many, many setbacks because of this. Um, I have, I was not very privileged to uh, go for coaching classes or to pay for uh, coaching classes and preps for exams. And that caused me a little bit of anxiety when I was uh, growing up because we would all be in a hall of 300 people sitting for an exam. And I know that I am more capable, but I suddenly don't know how to manage an exam because I have been studying overnight. You know, I have uh, tried to cramp in so many things uh, just to be able to answer the question. And so what have you, I don't have the luck of the draw and I just cannot answer my exam questions. But that truly does not make me a poorer student, right? So at one point, I, I thought that my 
socioeconomic background uh, really uh, caused a little bit of an obstacle. Having said that, I now see a lot of changes being uh, taking place. There's a focus on broad-based holistic assessments and uh, other kinds of development. And while we see it, it is still a very slow process. Right? Uh, but over the years, the exams have all evolved. And I think that that is something that is really, really good. Over the decades, we have seen how exams evolve. We have uh, outcome-based education, et cetera, you know, problem-based um, exams, uh, which allow academics to rethink, as uh, Prof. Prabhu has said, it allows academics to rethink, redesign, uh, reinvent their delivery to ensure students actually achieve their intended outcome. And uh, as rightly put, last year shook us up quick and fast. And we all had to make some real drastic changes in the way we um, thought, in the way we engage with students, uh, in the way we assess them. And some of us had to hold back a little because the um, digital evolution of assessments, um, was, we, we were not ready, right? And I'm speaking specifically from my experience. And when we looked at it, it was essentially a cultural change. It wasn't just about the remote proctoring of your exams digitally or what have you. It is really about us changing the way we think about reassessing our exam formats, our design, and a lot of it actually was about trusting the candidate and the process. So when we engage with some of the academics, not only at my institution, but uh, in many other institutions, a lot of it was about, I really don't know if, you know, the candidate is going to get the older brother or sister to come and sit for the exams. And I think that is something all of us really need to um, work around. It's the trust for the student. Um, I think students need to own their learning and we, we shouldn't be so hung up about things like that, right? So last year and also this year, um, Malaysia is not coping very well with the COVID and we are all working from home remotely trying to plow through this another year. We are not as quick as um, some other countries and a lot of us are still learning from it. And actually what my greatest fear is that post pandemic, while we say that there is a new norm, we might all fall back to doing what we are most comfortable with and what is most accepted, right? So we would be looking at, I don't know how much thinking we are going to put in to looking at whether we are setting assessments of learning, or assessments for learning, or assessments as learning. But I think what is most important from, from this year and, uh, and last year is that we must learn to reconcile assessments with our learning, right? And the role of a teacher or professor is really to provide valuable um, engagement with the student, uh, relevant and enjoyable environments for them to thrive, right? And to be fully engaged in the learning process. And once that happens, you will realize that you will be looking at assessments to bring out the best in the student, and they would then take ownership of that entire process. And the whole idea of trust and mistrust or distrust does not um, come into play anymore. But having said all that, I think what is most important is um, how institutions work with professional bodies with statutory and regulatory bodies 
to establish a more holistic standard and practices um, to, to focus really on the student and their growth as an individual, right? And there's one thing that I, I strongly believe will move the needle is global academic collaboration. We have so many um, vice chancellors sitting on this platform today. I think if we sat together and thought of a process with all our academics, we will be able to maximize the immense resources that we have. So I could have academics from India working with academics from Switzerland and Malaysia setting exams for various institutions. And I think the, the learning for not only the academic is, uh, is, is actually very powerful. There'll be shared ownership. Um, there's a expectation of a shared process. You look at the way people look at examinations and their belief is also because of what we value right? And who really influences our processes, our thoughts, you know, our upbringing. And if we can merge this all together with global academic collaboration, I think we would be able to make a difference in nurturing purposeful graduates, right? And um, when Dr. Raghavendra asked me to speak, um, I was thinking very hard, you know, what, what would I say? And I think at the end of the day, what is really important is the learnings that I have um, experienced, I have shared, and I have learned from other people throughout my journey in academia, is that if we want to make an impact, whether it's in education or examination or assessments or even in the lives of our students, the three areas that we must look at. The first is leadership and purpose. I think if we are very clear what we want, it is the leaders, the vice chancellors that can actually make a difference even in the uh, statutory and regulatory requirements. And I put purpose because of what my mother said. It has to be purposeful. What we do should not just be about ticking off a box. It should really focus on individuals as the center of what we're doing. The, the second thing is people and mindset. When I speak about people, it's not just the academics of the students, it's also the parents, it's also the industry, the employers, um, you know, the community. And how, what do they expect out of higher education? I have, um, when I teach, just like Dr. Prabhu, I don't give um, controlled exams. And we have a lot of pushback from the parents saying, you know, that that's not the right way to do it because I need to know whether my child is first or second or third in a group of a hundred students, where do they rank? And uh, it is actually very difficult to make that change because it is so ingrained in us that being on the at the top is always the best. Right? So that's about the people and changing their mindset. And the third one, which is actually very important, is the technology and reach. Um, I think as Dr. Amita mentioned, I, I lead a university that served the underserved. And um, when the pandemic hit, we realized that uh, our students were really disconnected from the system because they could not get connected. They don't have a device. They all had to go back to their villages. They don't have a device. They, the con connectivity is so poor. And then we now have to grapple with the digital divide. So um, I think technology is really important. 
and how we reach them, right? So while technology is uh, catching up, so to speak, we need to figure out how to reach students and keep them in the system um, so that they enjoy the whole learning process and assessments becomes something that they look forward to because they are now testing their own ability and challenging themselves as opposed to challenging the person sitting next to them. And so those are the, the conversations I think that we should carry on. And I believe in the next uh, couple of days, that's going to happen at the conference. So with that, I once again want to thank uh, COE India for helping me and giving me some space to speak on this platform. And my invitation to um, everyone listening in today and uh, being a part of this conference is do engage, um, write to me, and uh, let's see what we can do and make uh, this change something meaningful for all of us globally. Right? With that, I wish you a very successful conference. And uh, Dr. Amita, I would like to pass it back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam. Thank you so much for your for sharing your experiences and thoughts. Uh, now moving ahead, it is a very it is a great great pleasure for me to introduce our next dignitary, Dr. S. N. Sridhara. Dr. S. N. Sridhara is presently working as a vice chancellor at Hindustan Institute of Technology and Science, deemed University, Chennai. He has total. 32 years of professional and research experience. During 2019 to 20, he was director ASET at MIT University, Haryana. During 2010 to 18, he was principal and director of KS School of Engineering and Management, Bangalore. He has secured B in Mechanical Engineering from Bangalore University, India in year 1985, ME in Aerospace engineering from Indian Institute of Science in year 1992 and PhD in aerospace engineering for, from Indian Institute of Science in year 2000. He has guided eight research scholars for PhD and four students are registered for PhD degree. Sir has authored two textbooks. He has published 50 papers in international journals and presented 27 papers in international and 20 in national conferences. Sir has successfully completed research and consultancy projects worth 10 million. He is a corporate trainer and provides training to TVS, Mahindra, Bosch, Infosys, etc. He was invited for more than 75 times to deliver the guest lectures and keynote addresses in various audiences. He is expert of educational management, educational accreditation and organizing Indian conferences. He also participated in counseling programs in TV shows at several channels and occasions. He is awarded Bharatiya Vid Vidya Bhavan National Award for Best Engineering College Principal in 2015. During uh, 45th IST National uh, Annual Convocation that was held on 10th of June 2016. He was also awarded an, as an excellent principal in Karnataka in 2016. For excellence in education services rendered, he was awarded Vocational Education Award in 2014. He is acting co-chair academics in Associated Chambers of Commerce and Industry in India. On behalf of Council of Examiners India, I welcome Dr. Sridhara Essen for the keynote address. Thank you, Dr. Amita, and uh, my special thanks to the organizers and also the Honorable Vice Chancellors who have actually been uh, visiting this particular place from long distances and even from Malaysia also. And uh, we heard uh, already uh, the two Vice Chancellors uh, talking. And I have a few points just to mention over and above, and I would like to share my slides. And uh, let me just check whether I can do it. I think my slides are visible, right? Okay, thank you. 
and uh, quickly i'll go through a few slides and then i will uh, just add on to the points which actually has been already highlighted by the honorable vice chancellors uh, who are my predecessors here so first of all when we have a session with examination perspectives in higher education uh, in india and abroad we have to discuss more on that so let me just go to the small you know definitions first and then some issues which are actually you know going through and uh, also throw some light on what currently the uh, students parents and also teachers are facing problem in and a few solutions why right? so we say examination in general it indicates the process of assessing the learning done by a student or whatever the learning is achieved by a student will be assessed and that particular process is called examination so every course and program will have well defined course outcomes and program outcomes and basically examination should focus on how do we assess this learning outcome from the students it could be either learning outcome from the course or it could be learning outcome from the program and then we have to design the examination such a way that it estimate and evaluate the candidates improved attributes in terms of the outcomes defined in terms of knowledge and skill so that is very very important and that is where actually the whole focus of today's uh, you know examination process is under discussion and this is a very famous uh, you know one uh, cartoon which i'll be using and uh, thanks to the original cartoonist and also to the internet for providing me so what do you find here there are so many animals sitting in front of him and also um, you know a bird that is a crow for a fair selection everybody has to take the same exam so please climb that tree is that what examiner is telling for all this so there is a fish there is a dolphin there is a dog there is an elephant etc and so on and including a monkey so what it exactly says is students are quite different and uh, the courses which actually they also go through may be different and it is not actually justifiable justifiable to say that you know all of you should take the same exam or similar exam so that is what the whole thing so i am very thankful to the unknown cartoonist and also the internet for allowing me to copy this from there and now what type of courses are available and we can just go through that see for example some are completely theory oriented wherein the students listen to the lectures and are expected to reproduce the learnings in terms of multiple choice questions and essay type answers in the exam this is usually commonly seen in most of the indian universities as well as in abroad so it is more of memory oriented type of examination that fits into this and then we have practical courses or the practical uh, you know classes get the output and similarly you know comment on the final output now these are the conventional things which we are see here and uh, immediately when the uh, pandemic actually occurred especially 2020 early to the march i think all of us as vice chancellors as well as the education is had worried because most of our curriculum was based only on memory and how do we actually allow the students to be online also do not cheat and again you know remember everything from there and then write a proper exam so some of those papers which we thought earlier like engineering courses which could not be given in mcqs that is multiple choice question now invariably we have to design some questions which actually will be tuned to multiple choice questions and similarly others also still we have problem here see the courses like uh, english the courses like liberal arts and it is more of you know essay type answers people would like to see rather than mcqs because it is more of expression rather than remembering something and going so these are the real challenges what we find in some of the courses now what i will do i will take the focus on the types of courses what changes you can bring in these courses so that the examination or assessment also will be much useful or much will be helpful to us so the first uh, when you look at the type of assessment we have there are continuous assessments where the teacher keeps evaluating the student learning throughout the course delivery through some quizzes maybe uh, multiple choice questions and short questions etc so these marks will be usually added up in india most of the universities give about 50% weightage for continuous assessment and usually teacher will be doing it either in the group or individually but most of the time it happens only in the classrooms but not actually you know proctored in in actual sense because in a particular class if there are about 60 that is a usual uh, trend in most of our indian uh, universities or indian classrooms teacher will not actually ask you know the student to sit apart or something like that etc so there could be some sort of you know coordinated 
or cooperated the exchange between the students also these will come under uh, continuous assessments now comes actually as uh, gupta ma'am also actually mentioned and uh, there is a fear basically from the students for the final exam and that final exam is the end semester semester exams the teacher expects the student to answer the questions in the end semester questions most of them are memory based so for what we have here so this is the major problem okay and now there is different types of class which we can actually look at and nowadays uh, as also my previous speakers mentioned about it uh, the national education policy actually looks for combination of these so we have direct teaching in the classroom and which actually we are trying to put it in uh, online nowadays because of the pandemic there could be a part of self study uh, in in the particular syllabus maybe about 10% to 15% so the student will be asked to study himself with the learning material provided by the university or by the open sources and uh, it will usually be not taught but usually it can be discussed among i mean with the students as well as uh, among themselves like peer learning can be done next one is basically called project based learning so usually a teacher designs a mini project and he assigns these mini projects to the students in the class so these students after that particular learning whether it is theory or practical mostly these are open ended so they will actually you know carry out the mini projects either in the group or individually and the assessment will be done either through demonstration and also combined with uh, you know the presentation by the students in terms of ppt or online or offline whatever it is there is another called flipped classroom learning which is also similar to self study and i'll be discussing little more on flipped classroom learning and you may be wondering why i'm going towards you know pedagogy when we are looking at the assessment or the examination because this is the right time to think that you can actually you know do away with memory oriented courses or memory oriented teaching which actually requires a student to remember entire you know the learning what he has done and vomit i would use the word, you know, word called vomit on the answer paper within 3 hours or 2 hours whichever we are giving we are we are now it's a time for us to actually uh, think of you know doing away with these type of things now let me just look at uh, in a pedagogy what exactly is observed by all of us and uh, this again i am thankful to uh, the cartoonist and also the heen ventures who have created this particular thing what it says is in the learning period uh, i mean pyramid if you give lecture the retention in the students will be about only 5% and when you read something by themselves and the read the retention will be around 10% when you use your audio visual and as well as uh, uh, many other uh, you know the multimedia devices probably i think it will have better impact and nearly about 20% of the retention will be there from the learner when you make a demo basically some sort of you know experiments etc and so on about 30% and have discussion among peer combined with of course demonstration then the retention is about 50% you allow them to practice themselves and it is about 75% of the learning will come and the last one i think all we teachers have learned this very well that we learned much better when we actually started teaching others so when you say that you teach others in a class like you know the peer learning and the peer after end of peer learning is usually a person comes and teach others 90% of retention happens with them now our whole idea is basically how do we inculcate the attributes required into the student by a combination of these i am not telling that you can do everything or only one i would say that a combination of these types of you know pedagogy can be used so that the assessment also will be probably aligned with that now the next one is basically in the flipped classroom activities so in the pre classroom content what we do usually as per the bloom's taxonomy we have remember understand i think all of us know about it so in the please uh, pre classroom content usually we give them some material either in terms of written material which may be available in the uh, you know the internet or it may be also available elsewhere and uh, then we give this and from there we actually come to the classroom where in the classroom usually the students are allowed to interact with each other and uh, we get something of this type of you know like uh, facilities where student will be interacting with each other and the peer learning happens and now if you look at uh, the uh, flipped classroom uh, you know the uh, concept you will find that there will be an online learning there will be a group instruction and there will be collaborative activities when it goes to the collaborative activities people uh, the student will be learning better 
and also the assessment becomes much easier now the students communi uh, you know communication skills will improve their interpersonal skills will improve and the attributes can be easily be assessed not only by the teacher but also from the uh, you know from the peer learning or the peer uh, of them now in the project based learning there are so many things which actually we can uh, go through that in the pedagogy like there will be an inquiry the student voice and choice will be there there will be collaboration employability skills will be taken community partners will be taken feedback and revision will happen and then publicly presented products will be there and then reflection will come so that the student will have new ideas the standards or the content knowledge skills will be there authenticity also comes into picture so the project based learning and the flipped classroom learning are much much better today as a pedagogy and their evaluation also becomes easier or the assessment becomes much easier rather than going through only the memory based and at present i think many of us are using a few softwares very good uh, proctoring uh, softwares which are available and of course they are good basically they try to you know manage uh, the students movements the eye movements etc and say that okay this student may be in the process of you know cheating etc and so on but anyway if you try to shift over to these types of project based learning i think uh, the assessment also becomes much more uh, creative as well as much more easier now with the project based learning what are the major components you see here you will see the ownership you will see the creativity you will see the critical thinking you will see the collaboration and you will also see uh, the ownership coming in the students and this is really a very good uh, you know concept with uh, uh, for the assessment that i i would actually propose also i mean many other uh, educationists will agree with me that the project based learning and the flipped uh, classrooms will be very good for you know teaching the students as well as also uh, you know i mean uh, for the assessment and now the paradigm uh, shift in the assessment what we are finding is from memory based examination to the open ended examination so my peer speakers actually mentioned about it uh, it is still available in iit and also in uh, many other uh, uh, components uh, many other institutions where there will be an open ended examination and uh, the students will be uh, given a question paper either in the beginning of the course itself or at the end of the course so this is usual thing that usually you know you will find uh, in most of the open ended questions or open ended uh, this thing and this is going to happen uh, in future this is what i am just looking at and then uh, basically from the change in curriculum has to be done uh, so that this you need to shift from memory based Uh, curriculum or memory based for uh, you know pedagogy to content uh, learning and what actually the challenges are basically the training to the teachers is required training to the students is required before you one actually we do any of these types of examination into practice and then teacher actually should nurture the mentorship without the mentorship i think the open ended examination will not be uh, that much successful because the students have to be nurtured and mentored they should be taught properly how to take up this and then it is possible that you can move towards memory uh, assessment towards the open ended assessment and with that i would like to end my uh, small speech on this so my best wishes to all coes and participants and i am thankful to coe platform and also everyone on this particular organization uh, who permitted me or who invited me to present a few things and of course i am actually thankful to see many of uh you know renowned speakers here and the guests and thank you all thank you so much thank you sir thank you sir, for your enlightening words now moving ahead ladies and gentlemen i would like to take this opportunity to introduce to our next dignitary dr gopal krishna joshi dr gopal krishna joshi is executive director of karnataka higher state higher education council bengaluru prior to joining karnataka state higher education council he was dean of curriculum innovation and program assessment at kle technological university he was also the director of center of engineering education research at kle technological university which is founded to promote innovation and research in engineering education his areas of research interest include data engineering and engineering education he is involved in practice and research in outcome based education he he had made several contributions to innovations in first year 
engineering curriculum and the uh, project based learning practices he has 30 plus publications to his credit he has involved himself in design and conduct of number of faculty development programs faculty development and institutional mentoring are his passion he has designed designed and conducted unique faculty development programs he has trained more than 3000 faculty members on practice of outcome based education and about more than 3500 faculty members on examination reforms in engineering education for aict new delhi he is member of many professional bodies including institution of engineers india association of computing machinery and indian society of technical education please join me and welcome dr gopal krishna joshi for his keynote address over to you sir thank you madam uh, me I, i hope that I, i think that there is some technical difficulty uh, during the time i think if uh, any participants has joined late so i will brief the uh, details of what we have done so far and uh, what are the next uh, what next we are doing we have with us uh, dr prabhu agrawal vice chancellor benish university uttar pradesh dr vinita gupta dr. Can you hear me? Sorry. I think he is not in a position to join. Maybe we can move on. Hello, Amita, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, ma'am, maybe we can move on to the next speaker for the session. Yes, yes. Due to some technical difficulty, uh, now we are moving uh, ahead. And let me introduce to our next dignitary among us, Dr. P. Maliyadri. Dr. P. Maliyadri obtained doctorate in commerce in 1991 from Sh Sri Venkateshwara University. He rendered services in government with 33 years of experience. in teaching research administration hello. training and consultancy hello madam can you can you hear me yes, gopal sir. joshi yes sir yes sir please make me host i am sorry there is not an issue sir there was some technical glitch i think yeah 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 please uh, uh, amesh hello amesh sir dr joshi has joined us and Please share your slides. Sir, you are host now. Okay, I will share my uh, screen. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. It is. It is visible, sir. And I am audible. Yes. Sure, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, dear friends, uh, good morning, and uh, sorry for the uh, technical problems. And uh, this is how sometimes we are tested, and our stress yes. develops. Uh, thank you very much, the organizers, for giving me this opportunity uh, uh, to be with you and uh, interact with you and learn. Uh, the session's uh, topic is examination per perspectives in higher education. And um, uh, uh, to me, over the last uh, uh, 30 plus years, uh, this is what has been my learning. It is examination that connects all stakeholders of education. Examination decides credibility and character of education system. And examination is the effective means for continuous improvement. This is what I have learned over a period of uh, uh, 30 plus years of my uh, involvement in higher education. So what are the concerns of stakeholders when it comes to examination? For students, how do I get good grades? Pressure of performance. For parents, it is good grades and comparison. For faculty, it is additional work. More time is needed for design of assessment. Time pressure is there. For controller of examination, confidentiality, coordination, collaboration, time pressure. In fact, controller of examination is one person who connects all departments in uh, departments and schools in the you know university. For leadership, is the examination result better than last year? What is the perception of society and employers? For recruiters, it is students with grade, uh, good grades are not faring well in interviews and jobs. Issue of employable graduates. When these are some of the uh, uh, concerns of various stakeholders all around examinations. And to me, I, I, I find it to be, uh, uh, it's an intersection. It's an intersection. So when you look at, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I have been reading one book. Uh, I often refer to this book, How People Learn, uh, Brain, Mind and Experience at School. Uh, this is uh, published by National Academy of Engineering Press uh, USA. And then here, uh, this particular diagram talks about um, teaching strategies. Uh, teaching strategies and teachers choose teaching strategies based on their understanding of how students learn. Please know here. Their understanding of how people learn. Please look at this. Knowledge of how people learn. If you look at this central <coughs> circle, see, in this, you know, you have lecture-based teaching strategy, skill-based, inquiry-based, individual versus group, and technology enhanced. And I want you to look at the vowels, which I am show, highlighting. You know, you will, I want you to observe here and then tell me where are we in with respect to assessment. Where are we where are we in this with respect to assessment? Mostly, you know, we are here, lecture-based assessment in oral form. Most of the efforts. Hello. Will you, Shinivas Rauji, will you please mute yourself? Hello. So we are mostly here and our approach is written examination. Our approach is written examination. Though all other things seem to be good, they are all exceptions. It is not practiced commonly. Right? So, my uh, uh, the topic of this session is examination perspectives in higher education. This is too huge. And I was thinking as to what should I focus on. My context is National Education Policy 2020 and its implementation. My focus is on authentic assessment and formative assessment. Then second focus is on technology and assessment. Okay, so these are uh, this is how I'm uh, uh, limiting my my focus of today's uh, uh, um, talk. Uh, uh, um, 
and uh, firstly let me just take you to national education policy 2020 what does it focus on to exam please note here ah uh, examination assessment evaluation if you go little deeper their meanings are different but they are used you know as synonyms i am not getting into deeper details you know uh, uh, i am aware of that but then still you know i i am i'm just trying to operate at a level so that i don't create more confusions to people so national education policy 2020 whose implementation it is a it is a historic opportunity for all educationists to educationists to transform educational uh, uh, education in india right from early childhood education to higher education those of us who have been grumbling complaining we see that there is a resolve at the highest level to uh, 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 to make difference to educational experiences that we are creating to students what does it say you know i have just listed few of them you know it talks about flexibility so that the learners have ability to choose their learner trajectories and programs and thereby choose their own paths in life according to their talents and interests and there is focus on conceptual understanding rather than rote learning and learning for examinations we all know in fact i i would like to share whenever i conduct uh, uh, workshops on outcome based education practice you know i normally ask teachers to come with pa- you know, question papers of past examination and uh, we have a framework that we have designed to evaluate question papers for their quality using gloom text on me we have seen that uh, majority of the question papers that are, uh, 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 that we offer to our students uh, for uh, examinations they will be focusing on uh, 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 remembering and understanding mostly remembering level very few of understanding level questions and higher levels very rarely we are we able to see of course there are several reasons for that but then i just want you to know as against the current state you know uh, uh, the fo- emphasis is on conceptual understanding the the emphasis is on creativity and critical thinking which are missing in our in our curriculum also and obviously assessment uh, which happens at the end you know there is a, a big uh, uh, gap to encourage you know it it, it it hopes to encourage logical decision making and innovation we need to move from lower order thinking skills to higher order thinking skills we need to move towards cognitive and you know non cognitive skills whenever people refer to skills we should know uh, you know the general tendency is to equate it to psychomotor skills no it is not so it we are we are we are we are in tertiary education our focus has to be on problem solving and in that context we have to interpret everything and design quality learning experiences and the, the, there is a focus on regular formative assessment for, for learning rather than summative assessment that encourages Uh, today's coaching culture these are the words that i have taken as it is from nep 2020 and uh, there is a, 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 a there is an express mention of extensive use of uh, technology in teaching and learning removing language barriers increasing access for divang students and educational planning and management please look at this educational planning and management they are also technologies to be used so so uh, 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 so you know national education policy offers us great opportunity to to um, um transform uh, tertiary education higher education okay so uh, in this background i am just trying to focus on uh, authentic assessments formative assessments and um, uh, technology and assessment you know i am just trying to focus on these things you know friends actually uh, this is something which i wrote here our progression is synthetic assessment um uh, uh we need to move from 3 hours constraint all our questions are designed so that students are able to write examinations in a, uh, 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 for a 3 hour experience and then more, all this uh, assessment happens in the form of written examination from this kind of a synthetic assessment we will have to move towards authentic assessment and use this assessment for continuous improvement of both learner and the system both so this is the progression this is what i see uh, uh, for all of us so what uh, is authentic assessment 
it is a form of assessment in which students are asked to perform real world tasks that demonstrate meaningful application of essential knowledge and skills i want you to mull over this friends you know uh, uh, and compare this with what has been our conventional approach to assessment you get to know that it requires uh, huge efforts from our side to understand what it is and to to understand why is it required in today's context and to commit ourselves in terms how to make it effectively happen okay so so what are the benefits of authentic assessment when we assess people using this authentic assessment approach you know it can motivate and inspire students to explore dimensions of themselves and what that they may not otherwise overlook they may otherwise overlook it encourages the social aspects of learning by enabling active participation deeper learning you know what there is collaboration cooperation you know uh, there, there is collaborative learning practices cooperative learning practices assessments also happen there only so that is how social aspects of learning happens in fact constructive higher order thinking skills if you look at of bloom's taxonomy at higher level the construction happens through social interaction and it is linked to graduate attributes by providing students with real world experiences that's where once again nep talks about experiential learning experiential learning in terms of co-ops internships internships and bring you know making students work on uh, authentic uh, problems real world problems while protecting them from harmful and irrelevant elements which otherwise exist now these you know such attributes include critical thinking teamwork problem solving effective communication and uh, reflective practices and all of these are non cognitive skills friends and they are the ones they contribute to success of students and these can be acquired throughout life it makes students more self regulating and autonomous learners which is what we uh, we should do please note here we are in the space of higher education and we are dealing with 18 plus age group people and we as long you know if you want them to be successful you know they should be able to self regulate and become autonomous learners and it encourages students in processes and evaluations that are meaningful to them both now and in the future it facilitates a greater level of self reflection among students who are enfranchised now not only in their own learning process but in the evolution and development of modules and courses in fact uh, uh, my personal experience is i have used extensively student body to redesign my curriculum that's how we are able to uh, uh, retain uh, uh, the glory for our course because it is always into continuous learning mode and my students also are active participants of curriculum design process and how do we implement uh, authentic assessments identification of desired learning outcomes and alignment with tasks student communication and consultation which is very important then development of rubrics and marking criteria sharing with students if you let students know what is expected before the assessment is announced their performance is found to be better in research assessment implementation scoring and interpretation of results then evaluation and reflections these five steps together make an assessment authentic assessment friends so in this background now i would like to focus on formative assessment and shared assessment please know uh, um, nep is talking about defocusing term and assessments assessment for learning no it is the focus has to be on uh, i'm sorry assessment for learning uh, we need to focus on that not on assessment of learning okay so formative assessment is the process by which teachers provide information to students during the learning process to modify their understanding and self regulation please note here in fact it is much easier said than done we need to understand this a lot 
one of the question that bothers me is how is design of formative assessment and its communication to learner different from design of summative assessments and its communication to learners one of the techniques that we are trying in our system is that we give grades which you know uh, uh, which we give marks in formative assessment and then give students a uh, feedback and some time so that students when if they are able to incorporate those things and then come back and show it to us we 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 give them an opportunity to improve their marks in improve their grades in formative this is how you know there is an encouragement for student to submit his assessment uh, for you know uh, review and then uh, learn from that and then improvise and then proceed further then there is uh, uh, another thing called shared assessment friends this is where you know it refers to student involvement in assessment and learning practice a process of dialogue and collaboration between teacher and students aimed at improving the learning process both individually and collectively there are several approaches here one of the things that we 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 have tried is we uh, uh, the assessment rubrics we share it with students uh, uh, in the beginning of the semester and we display them before the commencement of assessment activity that is one thing then we also use peer assessment as one of the techniques not just instructor assessment we also use peer assessment that's where we have seen students becoming responsible right so so uh, what are the strengths of formative and shared assessments it usually improves the student motivation and involvement in the learning process that has been my personal experience as well it helps correct in due time gaps and problems arising during the teaching learning process therefore it enables the improvement of students learning process as well as the teaching learning processes it is a learning experience in itself given that it serves as an example for subsequent learning professional practice it's it is the most logical and consistent form of assessment when teaching is based on dialogic learning and or on student centered learning and on development of personal and professional skills this is what uh, um, nep is also focusing on that is where the educational world is moving friends it contributes to development of critical th thinking and self criticism it helps students become responsible and autonomous learners developing lifelong learning strategies it allows for a better understanding of students learning process it allows for a greater involvement of teachers and a progressive improvement of their teaching practices and finally it significantly improves academic performance in subject areas in which this type of assessment system is implemented and to me uh, in fact i have designed one particular course uh, which we have been uh, you know delivering for the past uh, five and a half years um, where there is no term and examination at all 80% of the assessment happens uh, uh, in semester continuous internal assessment and 20% it is for term end where we ex we make students exhibit their work for public and that's where we ask them to do self reflection and then you know uh, we assess that uh, uh, and give final 20 marks we have seen huge Uh, uh you know there is joy and purpose both that we are able to accomplish uh, uh, for learning process which i feel as an academic uh, uh, a great accomplishment so so now let me come to use of technology in assessment trends you know currently my observation is we we, we uh, the, the curriculum design delivery assessment and continuous improvement these are four areas where we we can use technology i see very rare nil use of technology in curriculum design and we see some amount of effort thanks to covid all of us are forced to use technology in delivery there is in but then we we are not uh, uh, empowered we are not equipped with required skills 
we don't have exposure to best practices because of which we have not been able to create quality learning experiences to students. Uh, um, so that is one thing which bothers us. Our study also has revealed us, which we are publishing. And assessment, there is a little, a little effort in assessment in terms of using technology, continuous improvement. No, we are not using technology. From here, where are we supposed to uh, uh, move? According to me, technology should integrate curriculum design, delivery, and assessment leading to continuous improvement. This is where we should move. This is what I feel. And uh, uh, um, in fact, uh, uh, to me, uh, there is so much we can talk on this. But then in, in, a, in a conference like this, I just thought I must raise certain issues of concerns for us so that you know we, we start discussing and then we arrive at some action uh, points for us uh, to go back and uh, 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 implement. So future directions, you, when I look at, uh, uh, with respect to examinations, when I, please note here, I'm uh, using them as synonyms. Assessment as a true indicator of competence Alignment with outcomes, this is something which we will have to accomplish, which does not exist today. And it, it, there, is a, there are efforts because people are going for it, you know, accreditation, but then I am seeing it, um, uh, I am seeing no serious effort in terms of understanding the competency-based education or outcome-based education. Uh, uh, people are trying to uh, get into form-filling mode or some routine modes because of which we are lowering the credibility of our system, assessment of knowledge, skills, and values, you know, we will have to do it. So we, we are good in assessment of knowledge. How do we assess skills and uh, values? Then, then comes, you know, how do we assess higher order, you know, thinking skills, you know, uh, application, applying, uh, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. And which means we will have to move away from time-bound examination to Time, the three hours examination to project mode. So we, that is where we will have to get into, uh, uh, you know, PBL, um, uh, cooperative, you know, P -P PBL, uh, uh, service learning, and, pro, you know, pro experiential learning, pro, you know, those kinds of pedagogies. And we only text mode uh, assessment to multimodal assessment we will have to move. And uh, anytime and anywhere assessment, the anytime and anywhere is not uh, teacher's choice. You know, it has to be choice for learner. Then emphasis on formative assessment and use of technology for continuous improvement of quality of teaching learning practices and design of courses and programs. We need to focus on this. Not just exam is not only to inform student, it is to inform the teacher in terms of his effectiveness, uh, whether the quality of learning uh, uh, experiences that he has created, uh, uh, it, it, it has to, you know, it's good. It should be subjected to evaluation. That's what uh, we should use it for. Then use of technology beyond administration, learning analytics, performance prediction, remedial teaching. That's where we need to move, friends. So, so uh, with these mm, uh, uh, thoughts, I would like to end my uh, presentation. Thank you for patient hearing and thank you organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Over to you, madam. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now, moving ahead, let me introduce to the next dignitary among us, Dr. Maladri P. Dr. Maladri P. obtained doctorate in commerce in 1991 from Sri Venkateshwara University. He rendered services in government with 33 years of experience in teaching, research, administration, training, and consultancy. He is a prophetic writer. Dr. Maliadri has authored six books and 141 research papers on banking, rural and economic developments, and management issues in various national and international journals of repute, including Scopus Index. He is peer team member and assessor of NAC. He has presented several research papers in around 100 national and international seminars and conferences. He is on the International Editorial Advisory Board as a member in 353 international peer-reviewed journals, including Scopus Index, published from many countries, including India. He has reviewed more than 3,000 articles for the international peer-reviewed journals, 
he has carried out two major research projects sponsored by UGC New Delhi. He he is a recognized research supervisor to guide MPhil and PhD students in the Department of Commerce and Business Management, Osmania University. Twelve PhDs and fourteen MPhils are awarded under his guidance. He is he he is an educator for the doctoral thesis in commerce and management in several Indian universities. He delivered a keynote address at various international conferences held at Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and Sri Lanka. He has acted as a chairperson of third international conference on emerging strides in innovation and skill enhancement, sustainable development, a key focus organized by Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand. He is also recognized research supervisor to guide the PhD scholars in the Department of Commerce and Management, Bharatiya University, Coimbatore, and Kanchi University, Tamil Nadu. He has served as program officer of the National Service Scheme for five years. He bought rupees 55 lakh and rupees 3.7 crores under CSR from Gale towards the construction of college building at government degree colleges. He has served as principal for more than a decade in affiliating colleges of Osmania University at Real Sima University. He also served as a director research and development in JNTUH and affiliating engineering college. He got an award of senior fellowship from ICSSR New Delhi and is presently as an ICSSR Senior Research Fellow at Center of Economic and Social Studies. He is also serving as inspecting authorities appointed by Ministry of Minority Affairs, Government of India to conduct inspections of the NGOs, institutions, a skill development center across the country for two years. He has received several outstanding awards for his academic achievements. He is state level best teacher awardee in year 2008, honored by government of Andhra Pradesh. His current research interest includes CMR, bank marketing, finance, rural management, human resource management, entrepreneurial development and strategic management. Please welcome Dr. Malyadri P for the keynote address. Over to you, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is it audible, please? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> a very good morning and a good afternoon. Honorable uh, vice chancellors of uh, popular universities in the country and uh, other eminent educationists. At the outset, I am thankful to Professor Raghavendran Venugopalan and also thankful to the organizer, other organizers of this uh, conference. I really appreciate for the idea, for conduct of IDEA 2021 during the relevance time. There are two reasons. One, maybe due to pandemic situation, and now we are in the process of new education policy 2020. So this is the right time to organize such a wonderful conference on examination reforms. Now, I will talk about uh, 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 one minute on a drawback of education system. In this connection, I wanted to give a uh, specify the quotation given by a top educationist. I will read the quotation. Those who make curriculum, they don't make syllabus. Those who make curriculum, they don't make syllabus. Those who make syllabus, they don't write textbooks. Those who write textbooks, they won't teach. Those who teach, they won't set question papers. Those who set the question papers, they never go for valuation of papers. So that is the main drawback of education system. Let us hope all these issues are resolved and addressed by National Education Policy 2020 and rectify the defects in education system. Now, 
I will talk about the reforms. In India, the largest student population in the world, which is staggering around 315 million students. India's student population is nearly the same as the entire population of the United States of America. No doubt, uh, the India, the Indian education system has evolved over the years. The education se sector in our country is booming, undoubtedly. The current social distancing norms have resulted in increase in adoption of technology for education process. Its market value is expected around uh, uh, 180 million billion dollars by 2020. Currently, higher education contributes to nearly 60% of the market size. In recent years, online examinations have been wider acceptance in education industry. It is quite interesting to note that uh, one of the advantage of conducting online exam is that it comes with number checks and balances to avoid any malpractices from being carried out. Perhaps these checks balances make online exams more secure and efficient in rooting out malpractices. Of course, the traditional offline pen paper based exams involved a lot of logistic, logistic and manual work, which is very, very tedious and prone to human error at multiple stages, uh, like uh, setting of a question paper, printing of question paper, printing the answer sheets, distribution of question papers and answer sheets at each examination center, collection of answer sheets at the respective examination center, manual evaluation of answer sheets. These are all the different uh, uh, issues which uh, we, we face in problem. So offline exams, examinations still have the risk of human errors, which won't be a problem with online examination, especially during the pandemic situation. Undoubtedly, many educational institutions throughout the world is success. So conducting subjective theory exams in a digital way can help to eliminate most of the steps like uh, setting online question paper, setting, uh, uh, sorry, students can type the answers in the online question papers. There is also facility to accommodate special symbols. Each student online answer sheet can be saved in the online system. Evaluators can log into the system and evaluate the answers uh, sheets with easy. So the results uh, processing is also very, very simplified. So the online examinations uh, undoubtedly provide us with a great alternative to offline examinations. So technology undoubtedly provide multiple solutions to problems which traditional exams face nowadays. So technology can help change the way examination papers are distributed among the centers and the students for traditional examinations. The question papers can be distributed to the centers via the internet with the added security of data encryption. So the present method, which follow, uh, definitely uh, uh, the control of examinations appoints a few ex few subject experts who design a question bank from the syllabus. So the subject experts log into online system and define a question bank based uh, at difficulty level, marks, objectives, and uh, uh, objective and uh, subjective questions and other parameters. So the examiner can define the question paper scheme and the system can be automatically generate a question paper and then the software can create multiple sets of question papers. So one of the question paper sets can be randomly selected and then be sent to the examination centers in a digital format. So later paper is encrypted and password protected, minimizing the chance of paper leak and other malpractices. So during the pandemic situation for the last one and a half year, we are success 
throughout the world. Teachers then have a manual evaluate the question papers, which take a lot of time. You know, students also have to dedicate time for re-evaluation period. So the declaration of results might take uh, several weeks, needs to be published too, which again is a tedious process. So the online assessment tools like uh, Yekalavya can reduce the burden of conducting offline pen paper based examinations on institutions and digitize the entire examination process with 100% accuracy and simplicity. So now the technology is going to play a key role in future considering its advantage of scalability, cost effectiveness. So the examination process can be simplified with the help of advanced technology like uh, adoption of blockchain technology. We can make confidential with the help of the blockchain technology. Undoubtedly, by utilizing the software of blockchain technology, definitely we can success in organizing and conduct of examinations very, very effectively. Assessment in India is based entirely or heavily on memory, while in US universities, it's more of applying skills, learning and research, takes home exams and class presentations. So who memorize answers in India tries to understand it when he is in abroad. So memorizing answers because of poor paper setting format and the attitude to copy projects and assignments, the value of the course go down undoubtedly. So the assessment pattern in United Kingdom is very unbiased and fair. In India, when we give an exam, we are not told on what basis we are being marked, but handed a random score on the discretion of the exam. So in India, the focus is majority on the written exams, majorly on the written exams. So if you talk about the system in various countries, there is a huge difference in course pattern because it is very flexible in abroad. See, counseling is generalized in India and there is a vast difference in the course pattern and you can get it, uh, choose what subjects you want to do and what time in the degree program. If you take the case of University of Southampton, United Kingdom, course pattern was interactive and practice oriented. Even course itself is uh, structured with a view of producing professionals. So mentioning that the course and the studies were very well structured and got good exposure and a chance to learn from experts. So therefore focus is not on exams. Scores will be given on the basis of presentation, function, that sorry, punctuation, language, research, content, and style. So these are all the important issues for providing scores. In United Kingdom, a student is monitored by his class participation, short assignments, assess his writing skills, group activities to stimulate vocational and auditory progress of a student, field visits or industry visits, and also general theory based written exams. All these sum up the entire assessment data. So assessment pattern in the United States is assigning students to group projects wherein group members rate the student on a, give, on a given criteria set by a professor or an instructor. So professors also give student assignments, take home exams and multiple choice questions. So common evaluation and assessment standards and tools are the results of the pressure of the competitive academic marketplace. The expectations and the requirements of employers and state agencies and the standard required by accreditation agencies and professional research associations. Now, I told you that we are in pandemic situation for the last one and a half year. It is the right time to adopt the latest technology 
for conduct of the exam, online examinations, online uh, evaluation, and what not. We can make reforms, undoubtedly. With that reforms, and the, after getting new normal also, if we continue it, definitely we will success. To conclude, majority of the students' opinion that the core structure and the assessment pattern are better in abroad than what Indian issues or what, what Indian educational institutions offer to the students. So let us hope all these issues are addressed and addressed by National Education Policy 2020. Thank you very much for a wonderful opportunity given to me with a wonderful platform. Thank you. Over Thank to the organizers. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are now pleased to have with us our next dignitary, Dr. V.K. Jain. Dr. V.K. Jain is presently working as Vice Chancellor at Sage University, Bhopal. He has earned MBA, MTech in Computer Science and PhD in Computer Science from Devi Ahilya University, Indore. He has been involved in teaching training, research, and administration for the past 25 years, which includes his 15 years of experience as a vice chancellor, dean academics, dean director, principal in various universities and institutions of repute in India. He has rich experiences in autonomy implementation, accreditation board of engineering and technology United States, IET accreditation UK, National Board of Accreditation, NBA India, and National Assessment and Accreditation Council, NAC India. He has been awarded Rashtriya Siksha Gaurav Puraskar in 2016 by Center of Education, Growth and Research, New Delhi. He has also been awarded as an Academic Leader of the Year in 2018 by ICC New Delhi. An Accreditic Management Teacher Award was also given by All India Management Association, New Delhi. There are more than 220 publications to his credit, including books, monographs, research papers, popular articles, etc. He has organized many conferences, seminars, QIPs, and delivered more than 50 keynote expert lectures. He is actively associated with many professional and social organizations, such as Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineering, Computer Society of India, Indian Society for Training and Development, Indian Society for Technical Education, Institute of Electronics and Telecommunication Engineering, Institute of Engineers India, All Indian Management Association, Association of Indian Management School, Global Conference on Flexible Systems Management, Quality Circle Forum of India, and Bharat Vikas Parishad. He is a PhD su supervisor at Modi University, Lakshmangar, and has guided 14 PhD scholars. He is awarded Fellow of IET UK and IETE New Delhi and Institutions of Engineers India. His recently public book, uh, published book include Artificial Intelligence and Global Society by CRC Press, An Introduction to Optimization Techniques by Taylor and Francis Sisgo, the Stance of E-Government Policies, Processes, and Techniques by Champion Hall, USA. Please welcome Dr. V.K. Jain for his keynote address. Uh, thank you, Amita, for our nice introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Council of Examiners, as well as the Skills Slate uh, uh, headed by Ame Agarwalji and uh, the respected dignitaries. It's really a wonderful opportunity for the uh, senior professionals uh, to express their views and uh, address the gathering. And although the, the number of people attending this is a very limited, uh, very elite group of people, uh, you know, uh, uh, it is not having uh, anybody who is not serious. So all the serious people of uh, very serious concern are attending this this kind of conference, and it's a very very good initiative uh, taken by both the organizations. 
and uh, I, I have been listening to uh, Professor uh, uh, G.H. Josi and Maliadri. So they have been uh, speaking about what kind of education system we have and especially the evaluation system here in India and abroad also uh, they were talking about. Actually, uh, we, have, we are in India and we should not forget our roots. Our education system, Indian education system has been very, very rich and very, very progressive right from our ancient times. There used to be the time when, you know, people from the world used to come to study in the universities like Nalanda and Takshila. And we were having our education system was value-based education system. And uh, we were supposed to uh, develop the complete persona of the student uh, instead of giving them, you know, uh, uh, only the sectoral knowledge or, or only the professional development. So uh, I would like to take you from the grassroots level. So my presentation would be in two parts. The part one would be talking about the importance of education importance of the teacher and what should be the qualities of a good student that still exists and it has to be there then only any student can learn now how these qualities uh, of a good teacher or a good student have been deteriorated over the period of time that is one aspect second aspect is how we were you know operating how education was provided and the assessment of the students was made in the ancient system and how we are doing it in the modern system. So there is a comparison of the two. Then in the next part, I would be talking about the present Indian education system and the foreign education system and what is the takeaway from this. So basically it would be having total four parts. First part would talk about importance of education, importance of teacher and qualities of a student. Part two would be talking about a comparison of the ancient education system and the present modern education system. Part three would be talking about uh, Indian education system and foreign education system, a comparison. And the fourth, fourth part would be a conclude, uh, concluding remark, which will talk about uh, how to move ahead so that we can match up the, with the speed of the foreign education system. Although our national education policy 2020 has come up with various kinds of new, new things and if it is implemented fully in this country, then it is going to change the face of the complete Indian, Indian education system and which is the need of the hour also. Because earlier students, you know, students used to study whatever subject they are or program they are studying and they are having no choice. If students is leaving in between the program, then they have to, if they come after five years, they have to again take the admission in first year and, and they have to continue the journey. There was a very little flexibility of, you know, choosing the courses of their own interest. So all these problems were there in the edu Indian education system. And many of these things are being addressed in the National Education Policy 2020. So uh, let me go to uh, my presentation, which uh, I have prepared. I, I, I hope that uh, you are able to see this presentation. Are you able to see it? Yes, yes. OK, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, if I uh, start my talk, like, you know, each, why, why do we study? Why anyone in this world study? Each one of us want to have the happiness, right? So in order to have happiness, we are going in for different kinds of different labels of studies, whether in India or abroad, because happy happiness comes from the success. And so each one of us wanted to be successful and success comes where uh, in the in the present definition of success it is defined with the help of money so if money is there we say the person is successful and money comes when we are you know with full of knowledge and humbleness and empathy and humility is there and all these things are given by an education system so uh, so the first of my slide is talking about what is the importance of education and this sloka has been taken from our ancient literature 
where it talks about vidya dadati vinyam vinya diyati patratam patratva dhanapnoti dhana dharma tata sukham it means if we are having knowledge then we will be very very uh, uh, very very uh, we will be having humility and we will be respecting others if we have humility and then then we can have the you know knowledge and skills to do some work and with the knowledge and skills we can we can find money and if we have money then we can get the success and happiness so uh, that that is uh, still valid and it is uh, still relevant in today's scenario but normally we don't talk about this because in this 21st century especially in the covid world when everyone is struggling you know for various things and so we are talking about only technology and we are forgetting about the basic human values coming to the next importance of guru right from you know ancient days uh, the 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 place of guru was even of a god so uh, as as we all know that uh, students used to you know uh, respect the guru more than more than the uh, uh, parents more than more than the god so guru gobind do khade ka ke lagu paaye balihari guru aapne gobind yo bataye so uh, if if guru has said something that was the final word uh, that were the final words for the students so uh, importance of guru was always there and we all have seen the deterioration you know and and the the kind of relationship which gives guru and sishya both used to enjoy from from ancient time and that 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 has been deteriorated i think we 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 all need to look into this also uh i uh, this is my personal feeling that you know each one of us uh, is having thousands of works with us and thousands of problems are there but we need somebody who can be our guide who can be our mentor who can be the philosopher uh, that that guide that can mentor can be a teacher that can be a uh, parents that can be a friend anybody so we all need a guru in our lives and it is said that and this is written by me only i have not taken it from anywhere it 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 goes like uh, it's a like uh, kabir ka doha uh, pattern so dukhon ke sansar mein dukhon ke sansar mein guru chhatri hai nek ise laga kar jo chale bhig na paaye ek so we all need to have a guru in our lives or that guru may be anybody okay so uh, importance of guru was there and it will always be there so coming to the uh, next point which is uh, what is expected out of a student and what quality a student must have i have seen in this corona time students are there for 18 hours on the laptops and mobile phones and they are not studying at all uh, they are on chats they are they are doing playing uh, games over mobile phones laptops uh, seeing movies together and all that they are sleeping at night 3 o'clock and and getting up in the in the afternoon 1 o'clock so a lot of things are happening but these basic things are not being remembered by the students so that says that kaak chesta bako dhyanam swan nidra tathai vichay alpahari grah tyagi vidyarthi panchalakshanam these are the five basic characteristics of any student kaak chesta kauwe kauwe ki tarah uski nigahe honi chahiye and बको ध्यान मीन्स बगुले की तरह उसका ध्यान होना चाहिए कंसंट्रेशन होना चाहिए एंड द स्लीप शुड बी लाइक अ डॉग स्वान निद्रा अल्पहारी शुड टेक लेस फूड वट एवर इज रिक्वायर्ड फॉर द बॉडी एंड ग्रह त्यागी हियर ग्रह त्यागी डज नॉट मीन यू लीव द हाउस बट यस ग्रह त्यागी मीन्स यू शुड हैव सम फीलिंग ऑफ यू नो सेक्रीफाइस सेक्रीफाइस फॉर फॉर गेटिंग द गुड एजुकेशन सो दीज आर द फाइव बेसिक कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स of any student now coming to a comparative study a comparison of indian education system what was the ancient education system and what is the modern system and so in ancient system we we were talking about knowledge with experience and here we are talking only the knowledge that is a major concern for us only knowledge will not serve the purpose knowledge with experience is required then only we can become successful earlier we were talking about the culture and morality now here we are talking about you know uh, syllabus and curricula 
earlier we 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 are talking about vedas and scriptures we we used to teach to these students and now we are teaching only the textbooks traditions were taught and here only history is being taught uh, values and ethics uh, earlier we were teaching and here it is completely missing because you know values and in the name of values and ethics we used to have one seminar of one hour you know there is no practice of ethicalities and and values and over, we were talking about the overall development and growth of the student and here we are talking about only the professional development if we talk about the teaching pedagogy uh, in earlier times uh, it was learning by doing again we are talking in 21st century all these skills we were practicing in the past but now we in the in the modern education system and and we are we are talking about that foreign foreign education system is having all these characteristics and indians indian system is not so but it was already in practice in india early in earlier days so learning by doing uh, used to be the practice and bookish knowledge is there learning by experiencing was also there now here we are right now we are restricted to the classroom teachings only uh learning through challenges uh, you may have heard various various stories of uh, uh, bhagwan rama or 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 maybe of arjuna so there used to be different type of challenges time to time and uh, so and students were tested their students were examined through these challenges and nowadays we are learning by experimentation learning by obeying the gurus now students have a feel that the teachers are paid and and teaching uh, is their duty so uh, th there's no need of paying any you know attention to the teachers and respecting the teachers or gurus learning used to be in gurukulas and ashramas wherein you know people from at the age of 8 to to next 15 year they used to be there in gurukulas and ashramas and they were they were studying uh, practicing experiencing they were doing everything but nowadays there is a day boarding student is going in the school for 4 hours a day that's it strong guru sis relationship now very weak and te only temporary relationship students are very uh, very very selfish and they they make the relationship only for a semester that is that i want to have relationship for a semester that teacher will award me a good marks uh if, if we talk about quality of teaching then uh, full dedication of teachers used to be there and now the teachers are also having professional behavior uh sishyas were supporting gurus for their well being and vice versa now the low degree of relationship is existing in the modern uh, system uh, earlier there used to be a system of kul guru wherein the the teacher used to be you know guide mentor not only for the, that particular student but for the complete family but here it is completely non existent nalanda and takshila uh, used to be the world renowned universities wherein the students used to come from all across the world now there are some institutions some good institutions like iits iims there may be few students coming from some neighboring countries but not from usa or uk or in uh, through well developed countries focus again used to be overall development now specific domain knowledge students development uh, used to be through empowerment now it is a guided learning and teachers respect was more than the parents and god we have already discussed and modern system it is a question mark so this is this is uh, what the comparison was between the ancient system and modern system uh i in in last few years in last 10 years i have visited uh, various universities across the world and uh, some of the universities i have listed and they are they are one of the best in the in the areas which have been uh, made bold uh, in, in the name of the university like johns hopkins university baltimore usa that is the best university for the robotics research in the world i visited that and found that how the students are involved into practical learning and research based learning and everything purdue university uh, is 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 very good for renewable energy university of north texas for biomedical engineering university of plymouth uh recently i was the uh, international expert for the accreditation of their engineering programs 10 engineering ugn pg programs 
uh, uh, for uh, under IET accreditation. So I have seen their system uh, very deeply. And Asian Institute of Technology, Bangkok, which is good for mechanical engineering. And some Indian universities are also there, IITs, Durki, Delhi, Bombay, and ISB Hyderabad, which is, which is the best even rated over and above IIMs, and which is known for case-based learning. So these are some of the good examples of the, uh, there are many others also, but these are the, uh, I mentioned only those which I have personally visited and experienced. So uh, now, now the next part comes that uh, how the Indian education system is differing uh, from the foreign education system. Now the, uh, the first point of comparison is option to switch. Here in India, if a student is taking admission in one program, then they have to stick to that program. They do not have any opportunity to switch to, uh, switch to different electives or, or they cannot select now, but slowly and gradually that system is being built now, choice-based credit system, some new good universities, especially private universities have adopted the system. But in, in if we talk about foreign universities, most of them uh, most of the foreign universities are having, you know, uh, uh, follow the um, more practical approach in education and encourage the fresh research. Sorry. Uh, most of the foreign universities in Europe and USA allow the students the options to switch the subject and don't limit them to just one subject. So it means the flexibility uh, is, is up to a great extent. So the students are able to live up to uh, uh, you know they are their interest area and they are able to uh, they are able to enjoy the the course and degree what they are pursuing so the development and learning happens more in this case uh, if we talk about ap approach uh, towards education in india the curriculum uh, in an indian education system uh, focuses more on theoretical education and rely on the research that has already been conducted in the past but there in the foreign universities, the curriculum is a more practical approach uh, and, and they encouraged uh, the fresh research and it is an important component of their curriculum. If initiative we talk about, despite the continuous help offered by the Indian government, there are limited research funds and therefore the research initiatives taken by the faculty, PG students and PhD students are very minimal or very limited. But in case of foreign universities, they are funded by biggest organizations such as Google, Microsoft, and hence research is an integral part of their uh, course curriculum. If we talk about exposure, India has not yet been able to internationalize education in order to attract students from various countries to choose programs offered by Indian universities. That is, that is the truth because in Indian universities, uh, nobody is coming from uh, the developed countries. But in foreign universities, people are coming from all across the world and they are getting better exposure. Coming to uh, the curriculum part, uh, modification based on uh, latest and approved research studies are implemented quite late in the curriculum of Indian universities. But in the foreign universities, they are very quick in updating their curriculum, maybe every alternate year. And they, they always focus on the advanced education system. Scholarships, if we talk about Indian universities are having very little, very little uh, uh, scope for scholarship offerings, but foreign universities provides n number of opportunities for the students and they, they can take also part in the work study program wherein a student is uh, being paid a scholarship and they are, in lieu of that they are supposed to assist the teachers or they, they may become teaching assistant kind of thing. So that is a regular practice. And uh, most importantly, the offering the scholarship is in the hands of the concerned teacher uh, of the foreign university from their research funds. But in Indian system, research funds are not, exist uh, not existing. Hence, this kind of practice is not there in Indian university system. If we talk about job opportunities, yes, job opportunities in Indian uh, education system is there, but it is very limited. And uh, I mean, here job opportunity means a good, good company and good package, but here it is uh, limited to only uh, great institutions like IITs, NITs, IIMs, IIT's, uh, ISC, NLUs, etc. 
but in the foreign universities it is the integral part of their curriculum and they they send the student at least for a year in a industry to work and they are being accommodated in the industry so what they do they 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 have hands on experience in the industry itself they experience the uh, culture of the organization and and they adopt the organizations and they are working in the real environment so that is the uh, biggest advantage for the students studying in foreign universities if we talk about return on investment uh, uh, return on investment in indian universities is very 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 less and uh, sometimes it is happening students have invested 15 16 lakhs rupees but uh, in in their study and they are just getting a job of uh, 12000 16000 15000 rupees only but here in uh, in case of foreign universities return on investment is is very very good uh, cost is although expensive but they get very good uh, very good start very good package because they are exposed to the industry directly at least for a year during their program uh in the concluding uh, remark i would like to say that uh, you know these are the uh, requirement of the time that in the current te teaching learning and evaluation system in india we we need to practice uh, all these things so that we can uh, we can at least become at par with the uh, world universities and some of the systems which uh, are mentioned here they were already there in the in the in the ancient times so uh, uh, the recommendation is that uh, most of the universities almost all universities should implement the choice based credit system wherein a student is having ample opportunities to to select their um, electives those electives can be the major electives or minor electives and uh, and they, they these electives can be uh, uh, spread over across the different disciplines so uh, this this will give the students the liberty to to you know enjoy the uh, undergraduate or postgraduate program and the learning would happen and there would be multi dimensional personality as well as learning of the students and that will ultimately result into good placement of the student outcome based education has to be practiced each each course has to be you know uh, assessed for the uh, course outcomes so program outcomes program educational objectives program outcomes course outcomes has to be mentioned in each of the course and each course outcome has to be mapped with the bloom's taxonomy and it has to be assessed through different assessment processes whether it is a mid term examination or it is a quiz or it is a end term examination so that has to be there and each university uh, should uh, should adopt the bloom's taxonomy based teaching learning wherein all the six labels of bloom's taxonomy to be adopted and accordingly the course outcomes has to be defined and it has to be mapped and so that students when they reach to the final year of their program they are able to reach up to the sixth level highest level of creation of something uh, whether it is it is it is a new creation of new knowledge or creation of a new product or or some innovative service so they reach to the level of creation means application analysis uh, evaluation and creation third fourth fifth and sixth labels are reached right now there is a very pathetic situation of indian uh, evaluation system wherein most of the traditional universities are are asking questions uh, attempt any five out of eight each question is of 10 marks you know that 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 is not going to serve students are mugging up the things and they are they are just uh, writing on the piece of the paper there is no learning at all so learning real learning will 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 happen only when we are mapping the outcomes uh, and and our teaching learning would be in that direction uh, experiential learning or activity based learning has to be introduced and in each of the unit each of the uh, topic there has to be some some experiential learning uh, some uh, it can be done through various things maybe maybe a uh, field trip uh, there there may be a, a, a role play there may be a quiz debate a case study or 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 in the laboratory experiment so experiential learning is one of the important concept which has to be practiced by all the indian universities 
then coming to a project based learning i think from uh, semester 1 itself students should be exposed to work in groups uh, decide the project topic learn the methodology write the report check the plagiarism write proper references all these things are practiced so that when they reach at the end of second year when good they go to the industry uh, they would they would really be demanding that uh, yes i i am interested to do a good project kindly give me the project and they would so more level of seriousness and more confidence when they face the world learning while doing this is again another uh, uh, another uh, activity based uh, kind of teaching learning process so that has to be practiced and on the job training has to be encouraged uh, maybe uh, at the end of every year uh, students should be sent to you know uh, different places wherein uh, they would learn uh, the the real uh, they would experience the real uh, environment of the industry and uh, the most important research based teaching learning should be encouraged especially uh, in in the final year of the under graduation uh, Uh, as the national education policy is also showing that if the three years degree would be given a graduation and if a student is studying in the fourth year of the degree then it would be a degree graduation with a research research uh, input so the research based teaching learning has to be encouraged and so uh, i think if we uh, adopt all these practices we would be at par with any of the foreign university uh if we talk about the uh, credit system in india and abroad uh, you know uh, recently i was uh, comparing the you know credit system india we, in one year we teach around 40 to 50 credits but in in uk they are teaching uh, 120 to 150 credits wherein they are having four or five modules each of 30 credits so they are having a very very comprehensive module wherein a lot of learning happens so in indian system what we do we teach uh, multiple varieties of su subjects in which students are not able to master into but they teach only selected uh, subjects and they they expect that students should be mastering into those subjects so uh, that is all from my side thank you very much for uh, giving me opportunity to talk to all of you and thank you very much thank you amit ji amita ji and all other office bearers of both the organizations for giving me an opportunity to talk to you thank you very much thank you sir thank you sir for sharing your experiences and thoughts now moving towards the closure of this session i would like to introduce the next dignitary professor indra krishan bhat professor in the krishan but born in jammu and kashmir through his sheer determination hard work courage and discipline started his journey from his early education in his native village to nit srinagar and then iit kanpur and then he became a director of several institutions of national importance like nit hamirpur and nnit jaipur he also held additional charge of nit jalandhar nit delhi and iiit kota rajasthan during his tenure as director in nit hamirpur mnit jaipur he took several initiatives towards building a better infrastructure better academic and research environment for providing better quality education training and extension activities that has given these institution a global visibility he has served in the public works department of jammu and kashmir state for a brief period of 2 years He has served as a lecturer and reader at IET Lucknow during 1986 to 1994, and professor at Motilal Nehru sir, Institute of Technology. Sir, Abhidhan. good afternoon. Tell me, sir. Since 1994 till his retirement, he has guided 13 PhDs and several MTech theses in area of in area of energy, petit wear. material characterizations and academic management he has published over 150 papers in journal conferences and seminars he has delivered more than 300 special lectures on academic and social issues he has served as the advisor in aict for the period of 3 years member secretary in national board of accreditation during 1999 to 2002 he is mentor on accreditation to several institutes in the country and he has been a resource person on accreditation member of board of governors of several technical institutions
He was also the member of Joint Working Group of Electronic System Design and Manufacturing of Ministry of MSME. He was member of Central Advisory Board of Education, Government of India. He was also the member of boards of several institutions, including GLA. Professor Bhatt has served as founder vice chancellor for MIT World Peace University, Pune. He is currently working as a vice chancellor of Manav Rachana University. Professor Bhatt is a fellow of Institution of Engineers India and a life member of Indian Society of Technical Education and founder member of IUCEE India. He has contributed at policy level, being associated in developing NBA Vision 2002, AICT Vision 2015, drafting first statues of NITs, drafting IIIT's bill under PPP module, AICT strategic plan for the 10th period, and regulations of National Board of Accreditation. He is also the advisory member, he's advisory member and the mentor for the Council of Examiners India. Please welcome Dr. I.K. Bhatt for the keynote advisory address. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, yes sir. Thank you very much, Amtaji, for nice, kind words which you have spoken. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, especially to all the pan uh, panelists and the resource persons of this conference for, and the participants who are present uh, in this particular conference. First of all, let me thank uh, the organizers, especially Dr. Raghavinder Ji, for making me a part of this very important inaugural session uh, and has given me an opportunity to share my views uh, with the esteemed participants uh, here. And I feel really honored to be present here amongst all of you. I'm pleased also to see that the Council, uh, the COE India is continuously engaging itself uh, with stakeholders and holding various meetings, conferences, uh, different sessions like meals, raise, next idea, which help uh, uh, all society actually, all the community of controller of examiners, examinations, uh, which is helping them. The distinct speakers who spoke before me have given you everything. Right? They have talked about different aspects of the uh, conference and not much is uh, left to be spoken, actually. However, I think that uh, I consider this National Education Policy 2020 is a very forward-looking vision of education system which has been proposed by the committee and particularly for higher education system in which I have been working over a period of more than 40 uh, years now. It aims at meaningful and satisfying lives of the stu uh, students of today and have work roles in development of the society, which in fact, uh, uh, Neeta Ji was talking about. I think looking at that vision, which is very important, uh, what can be done and there is a lot of things can be done and I was fortunate also to be part of the task force for uh, creating the implementation plan of national education policy at the uh, government level and therefore I uh, have gone through each and every part of it. When Dr. Pr uh, Prabhu was talking about the changes which are required I totally agree with it. I thought that he is speaking what I was supposed to speak and therefore he, I totally resonate with his ideas and that is what needs to be done. When we look at uh, the current system of examinations, whether we look at the uh, Radha Krishna Commission, which was in 48, 49, or Mudliyar Commission in 52, 53, or Kothari Commission, which was in 
all have in fact talked about they have great, given great emphasis to the need of reviving the student assessment process they said the examination system which was earlier there suited the british people and therefore this should be done away with but now we we are still working uh, with the same system most of the universities though some of the universities have gone away from it also so all these reports including national education policy of 68 and national education policy of 86 including its action plan uh, which was uh, in 1992 they talked about uh, evaluation has to be improved and it must be for learning and they have said that examination is not for the purpose of examination and they have said it has to be continuous and comprehensive evaluation of the qualities which are improved by the education system in the student and he becomes a useful citizen of the country that is what is the issue actually now when we look at uh, the present day system we find that it is to have a good outcome we are talking about outcomes we are talking about everything but we do not talk about the effect effect to domain or the psychomotor domain we talk about the cognitive domain but i think all these three domains must work together actually if we are not in a position to develop the child in the all three domains then we are not doing a good job as a teacher the policy also suggests that the, there must be self assessment and assessment by teachers has to be there assessment by peers has to be there assessment by the parents has to be there every one should be in a position to assess the student and see that there is a change in the student after he has gone through the education system which means there has been what people are talking about 360 degree of assessment which is very very important uh, and that needs to be done other feature which this national education policy and the sages is that the institutions all institutions must be auto- autonomous and when we say this autonomous it means that it has effect on the examination system it has effect on the role of uh, 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 coes it also says it must be broad based multidisciplinary education it talks about providing holistic undergraduate education with flexible cur- curricula people have been doing it i have been a student of iit kanpur and i have seen it there 40 years back this was absolutely flexible system people it was left to the teacher to decide what he wants to do there was no examination there was no con- con- controller of examination in a uh, system so with creative combination of subjects integration of vocational education multiple entry and exit after every one year so this is a change which is now coming up and uh, as far as the implementation committee is concerned all of us have uh, given plans how do we execute this in order to make this education useful innovative and uh, entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurial basically it also talks about moving from content based assessment to competency based assessment which means we are looking at the psychomotor domain also we are looking at affective domain also which is a very important and it also says we have to now use appropriate pedagogies optimize on higher order learning for development of the student it means creating new pedagogies also so this is what is important the policy also talks about the freedom to the faculty to design their own curricula pedagogical approaches learning to happen assessing this uh, learning both through adaptive and uh, formative assessments and therefore the question is the assessment has to be of learning and assessment has to be for teaching it is not only how much he has crammed which is uh, to be understood so i will now like to focus your attention on three aspects which nep is there which it talks about various provisions are there which uh, it is talking about i will just focus on three uh, aspects of it one is assessment the second is how the role of controller of examination is completely changed changing and it seems that they are becoming redundant and the third one is the autonomy so these three aspects 
I consider are very appropriate to this um, conference of uh, controllers of examination and they should listen to me carefully what I am saying because otherwise if they do not change, things are going to be very serious. So one of the aspects of this NEP 20 is that the students can earn credits through online courses also and the uh, regulating bodies have also accepted it. That means they are not under the ambient of your examination system. They will earn credits from some other universities and it will go to an academic credit bank where they will be deposited and will be counted when the final degree is to be given or a certificate is to be given to a student. So therefore, your role is becoming different now. Your role is not the same as what it was, in fact, earlier. I'll come to that role also slightly later. So such approach, in fact, focuses on employment, employability of the student with opportunities to choose courses of interest and earn certification, thereby bridging the skill gap required uh, in the job market. And that is what is very, very important, in fact. So this academic bank of credit or the credit bank, whatever you would like to call it, is a new concept which was not present earlier. I can do few courses from one university, few courses from other university, few courses from maybe university which is in Australia or some university in America or some university in France. So I will be basically earning credits. So this is what is important. So this brings us to the issue of assessment. We shall play a very significant role as far as the job responsibility of COE is concerned. All of us know that the examination is an important part of our education system as far as we are concerned. But this present day examination system is now based on cramming I have gone to more than uh, 100 institutions for various inspections and interactions. And I have found that the quality of question papers is very, very poor. It is based on cramming and uh, to pass the examination has, to, uh, has become more a matter of chance than that of the ability. Actually. So therefore, how do we uh, go away from it? And if we uh, one wants to major whether the aims and objectives of higher education have been fulfilled. The assessment needs to include tests of understanding, such as ability to interpret, exemplify, summarize, compare, explain, and also ability to apply this knowledge somewhere in a situation which has not been defined earlier. Analyze a system which is an unknown, or you are analyzing it for the first time. Evaluating systems, synthesizing systems, and creating new systems will become important. And not only this, one more dimension, the ability to communicate is again becoming very, very important in all areas of life. So are our students by passing an examination, which we have as of today, most of the institutions which we have in the country, are they really working in this particular direction? So the examination method has become, has an important influence on learning. What is being examined? how it is being examined, how the student has been taught, all these things will matter. And we have, as was said earlier, that uh, we have an examination system for all. Same question paper, things are changing. We're talking about personalized learning and therefore the written examinations, including short answers, open book examination, multiple choice question papers, computer-based assessments, take home exams, oral exams, jury exams, report writing, all these are new methods which, are, which have to be included into the system. Let me tell you, I used open book system uh, almost 20, 25 years back. And our teachers in IIT Kanpur also gave us a choice to solve this problem using any book, go to the library, come back after three hours, four hours and submit this. Uh, and we would really find it uh, harder to uh, solve those problems, even if all the books were there, because these were application-based uh, problems. So in future, assessing the application of knowledge is going to be the model of examination or whatever you call it as assessment. 
and it has to be a continuous and comprehensive evaluation. I think it is the teacher who can do it best. This, he, the teacher uh, can take quizzes, tests, interaction, uh, every minute in a class, and he can keep on assessing the student and giving him feedback simultaneously about his uh, learning. And the student has an, uh, has an opportunity, in fact, to uh, correct himself or uh, redo certain exercises or read something else, apply it to a particular situation and then learn uh, completely. And this is what is going to happen. And this, this is uh, a future scenario where the role of COE is nowhere there. Ultimately, it is a teacher. See, in IITs, NITs, or many central universities, central uh, universities, there is no, if you look at their ordinances, or if you look at their acts and statutes, there is no post of uh, uh, controller of examination. Every teacher is supposed to be the examiner. And his examination is every hour, he, every second, he has to be uh, examining his students and creating learning what is more important. He is examining for seeing that whether the learning has taken place or not. So that is what is very, very important. So the continuous assessment can be done through various types of uh, uh, examinations, which I just mentioned just a uh, few minutes, seconds back. And it also includes activities that require studying throughout the course, Assess assignments, cross group discussions, case studies, problem-based learning, project-based learning, study question covering a wide range of course content is what is required and that is going to uh, happen shortly. And this is, these activities are going to be vital to help students check uh, on their understanding and uh, identify their knowledge gaps. It is not to test how much marks he got, it is basically to test how much learning has taken place and if there is a gap, how do we bridge that gap? Is the role of the teacher actually now. So remember, whatever type of assessment is used, the teacher must give feedback to the students so that he progresses in studies. And these mistakes which he has made should not give him a, a class of he has failed or he has passed, but he has given, he is being given another chance to learn. That is what is important for this. So this, there is a lot of debate going on, whether the institution of examination should be continued or should it be abolished. Now it depends upon the controller of examinations who are today working in this particular section that how do we uh, go ahead with this continuous assessment and uh, Im improve this ability, power to toleration, perseverance, communication and other good qualities which are effective domain uh, uh, parameters, how do we uh, improve that? And this is what is very, very important. And uh, it is not necessary to cram, but uh, passing an examination must give us an, a certification that certain learning abilities are associated with the child. So there is a strong case that the examination in the current forum should be abolished. Now, yes, I also agree to this, but it requires to be reformed so that it could be of a greater advantage both to the student community and to the society. And therefore we should follow the old, uh, we should not follow the old orthodox uh, uh, system of uh, uh, examination, but maybe more scientific, uh, logical, where changes are made and it is brought to a system where a new system of examination evolves. And this brings me to the second point, which I said, the changing role of uh, the controllers of examination. The controller of examination has a um, uh, lot of powers and responsibilities. He is the principal uh, officer in charge. He conducts examination, he supervises examination, he informs the vice chancellor and the academic council. He makes all the arrangements for necessarily Hold, uh, holding the examination, tests, and other things. He is also responsible for preparing academic calendar, uh, the schedules, and, other, and implement them, appoints examiners, 
moderators, printing question papers, evaluation, all this in fact, and ultimate timely declaration of result, postponement and con cancellation of examination, ensuring co uh, confidentiality, appointing outside agencies in order to uh, conduct examination and also evaluation of the papers which we are doing now. So therefore, the, you can see that he has so much role to play uh, and how do we now uh, look at uh, the changing role of this uh, uh, controller of examination. In my op opinion, the controllers have always been a vital support for management in the education system and NEP 2020 and the future of controller of examination is connected. And I consider that the controller of examination has to partner now with the faculty, with the students, with outside agencies, and make this change, which NEP 2020 is envisaging to happen. It needs upskilling and it needs specializing. And this means that we need to reinvent the role of controller in this digital age and capitalize on new value uh, which are uh, value-adding activities. And today's technologies, besides posing new challenges, is as well bringing the additional opportunities to us. Why can't we make use of these additional opportunities and become better off? Because next year, new technology will be there. After five years, there will be absolutely new technologies. The current technologies will become obsolete. And therefore, how are we uh, updating ourselves will become the most important. So the reshaping, the controlling mission is not only about changing and managing new risks, but also uh, perhaps most importantly, about unlocking the opportunity, massive opportunities which we have in the system. And if we want to stay ahead and do not want controller of examination to be redundant, then we will have to be proactive, major oriented, and we must be adding value to whatever is being done in an educational institution. Why the sudden need for change and do uh, this uh, has arisen? There are a lot of reasons for this. And the reason is you have to evolve from controller to co-teacher because the teachers also will have to keep on upgrading every year. They also need technology to be handled, which will keep on changing every year. So the controller of examination should be now looking at that how do they handle this technology and training them so that they use it effectively for learning of the students will become important. Instead of paper pusher, he should become a digital uh, champion. Evolve from number cruncher, which you have been doing so far, you have to become a data analyst. Every controller of examination should become a data analyst play a critical role in building the all important new academic methods of the future. You can help teachers to evolve new rubrics, new, evolve new techniques. See, if you go to uh, uh, this canvas, or if you look, look at Blackboard, or if you look at Microsoft Teams, there are certain uh, things shown there, how you can evaluate your student. And you can keep as, as soon as he gives an answer, he is evaluated simultaneously. And in case he is giving a wrong answer, then a feedback also goes simultaneously. So depending upon how much work you have done in order to develop that system of assessment will become very, very important in, uh, in my opinion. So play a critical role in building an all important new academic model for future. This is what you should be doing now and initiate transformative projects in the organization. Break the existing silos, be new networks, work with new collaborations, new collaborators, and increase the productivity of the system. This system is going to be agile in future. And you have to live with this cross-functional teams which are agile and teach them also. So do something new today. You can be part of an evolution or a revolution. It is better to be part of an evolution rather than a revolution because in revolution you always think of negative things uh, code four and all those things so therefore my opinion is things are now coming it is not very difficult to evaluate the subjective matter the robotic process automation has taken place and they can evaluate the uh, content also so therefore what is the role now 
So if the teacher uh, uh, is supposed to teach, you are supposed to teach the teacher actually how to teach better, not the content of the uh, subject, but how to teach it better and how to evaluate learning so that if there is no gap between the objective and the outcome, which is very, very important. So all uh, this is what is required to be done. Now, in the present, uh, uh, particularly in the present uh, scenario of uncertainty, practical ways you have to devise, uh, most practical ways to pro, uh, prepare for the future of controlling. Identify the specific skill sets which are required by such a person as I envisaged, a data analyst, a person who will keep on uh, educating and training teachers will become very, very important. So you have to have affinity for technology. Before anyone else learns, it must be COE and his team who is, uh, who is learning that new technology. So that is affinity to uh, learn, uh, affinity to technology. You must experience in data analytics, exploration, competence, and controlling these agile teams, which will become very, very important. New and new innovative techniques are coming, which is important. Again, see when people are now talking about e-content, so the e-content has to be prepared. The e-learning, the blended learning is going to stay and therefore the e-content will become very, very important. How do they make it? Somebody has to tell them. I think the controller of examination, uh, who can become the best judge to see that the learning is taking place, can become also an expert in telling teachers how to create a good e-content, which is very, very important. So your role is to enable a continuous improvement uh, along uh, the entire uh, this value chain, which we are talking about. So start your journey of transformation now in a mission mode. If you do not do it, you are out of the game, actually. You have to be a uh, uh, stable, like managing change. You have to be an operator running an efficient and effective operation in the university. You have to be a strategist, influencing the future directions of the organization and use data to prove it actually. And you have to be a catalyst helping the uh, drive execution of these new technologies so that better learning takes place. This is now your role. Follow these critical steps. My request to controller of examiners is examinations is can, they can they, if they do it, they will be empowered. And then they will have a place in the board to sit actually a very important position in future. Otherwise you are out of that board actually. So therefore the vision of the future is that you must uh, have a clear direction, uh, align your goals now with what is uh, the future direction, prioritize things, skill yourself, and that is what is very, very important. So therefore, you have to focus on learning. That should be the uh, question. The student-centric learning is what is essential. And you have to be the champion of it. You should be talking in uh, for the students that whether the learning is taking place or not, that is your role. And train your team right from now and enhance the efficiency uh, this, uh, of your team. If you do it, I'm sure that you will be in a position to uh, improve, reduce costs, and uh, do strong analytical. You need to have strong analytical skills for this in order to analyze things. And this is what is important. So therefore, when we talk about the blended learning, which is going to be a new norm, I am sure that it will not go away. You have to talk about the continuous comprehensive evaluation assessment inside the class, not outside the class. I am not looking at examination hall, conventional examination hall. I am talking about the evaluation assessment has to be done while the learning is taking place. That is the place where you are uh, supposed to be there. So therefore the modular um, curriculum demands assessment at several intervals. It could be 20 intervals, it could be 10 intervals, or in, in a project-based uh, learning, it could be one project has to be executed and there are four or five steps uh, these will be evaluated, the student will be evaluated at that stage. So you have to be innovative uh, in evaluation and assessment and uh, use whatever techniques you want. 
use whatever strategies you want. Whether you want to have open book, group examinations, uh, spoken examinations or on-demand examinations, whatever it is, or whether we are talking about e-portfolios or whether we are talking about creative, productive, innovative pedagogy, whether we are talking about quizzes, online classes, everything, this is what you will be handling. You, today, artificial intelligence is becoming one of the very important tools. Learn it, how to use artificial intelligence tools, uh, uh, intelligence tools, but proctoring as well as assessment of the students will become important. So therefore, the conventional examination has to be redefined in terms of assessment section. And this is what I personally think is very, very important. The, in, the intent uh, is to unlock better quality learning by using assessment in all three forms, for learning, of learning, and as learning. These, all these things have to be done together. When we look at now the third aspect, which I said, uh, I have very little time. Uh, but I'll just try to finish it in another four, three, four minutes. The autonomy. Look at, we have got 2% of the institutions in the country who are, who are autonomous. And we want all the institutions to be, another 98% of the institutions to be autonomous. Now, how do we do it? So this has to be done using technology. You cannot use it anyway, and you will have a demand as analyst, as a uh, visionary uh, uh, controller of examination. All these institutions will need future directions, which are very, very important. Again, the gross enrollment ratio the government is talking about going from 27 to 50 percent. Now, how do we uh, create that infrastructure? We have come to 27% in 70 years, and in another 15 years, we want to go to 50%. This is a challenge, and this has to be done uh, because there is a pressure as far as internalization or globalization of education is concerned. We they need to have similar. You cannot have a year system, and they are, they are talking about trimester system. You, they cannot be really judged together. So therefore, you have to think about it. And when we look at autonomy, I'm looking at not only academic autonomy, but the institutions need to have financial autonomy, organizational autonomy. Autonomy to select the people is what is important. So therefore, uh, these things will become very, very important even in future. Swami Vivekanand said, education is not the amount of information that is put in your mind and runs right here undigested all your life. The use of higher education is to find out how to solve the problems of life. This is what is important. Similarly, he said, education can unlock all doors for progress. A nation advances in proportion to education and intelligence spread among the masses in the schools and colleges. So therefore, look at this. Uh, visionary people who have been talking about these things. So therefore, the intent is to unlock better quality learning in the students by having all the autonomy among the teachers, among the students to work together, uh, give them the uh, right type of environment, give them the right type of assessment tools in order to see that there are minimum gaps which are present in uh, there. And this is not difficult. I have tried it in several institutions. And I have removed the controller of examinations from the rules completely uh, in almost four or five universities so far. Uh, while writing the, uh, this NIT statute, we did not have any controller of examination. So therefore, every teacher is supposed to be conscious teacher, a teacher who understands what is his role, and then and only then he is supposed to be part of this whole process of evaluations, of teaching, evaluation system, and other things, which are very, very important. And uh, I once again thank all the people, all the participants, and all the resource persons who had come here, gave their critical uh, opinions about uh, what uh, they are doing and what experiences they have gained which is very, very important. And uh, um, I once again thank uh, Raghavanji, uh, for Raghavendraji for uh, giving me an opportunity to be part of this very important 
event. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, Thank for you, sir. your valuable suggestions for this UE across the India on assessment and evaluation. Sir, UE India pledged to to follow the directions which you have expressed, sir. Thank you so much, sir. On behalf of Council of Examiners India, I extend my sincere thanks to all the dignitaries who has shared their valuable time in, ex in expressing their views on examination perspective in higher education. Now it is the time to take a break. We will resume here at 2 p.m for the next session where the experts will be debating on the India's national education policy for and against. Do join us after the break. Thank you. Over to you, Amesh. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much all the dignitaries, uh, the guests, all the vice chancellors and all the great people we have today for the conference. It was a really wonderful experience to listen to all. And I have been watching the YouTube comments. Uh, hundreds of people are joining us live on the YouTube and they are really enjoying the session. Uh, thank you so much. I thank you on behalf of uh, Skillslet Foundation uh, that you took time to uh, come here and share your expertise on the session. We hope that uh, we will get a chance to have you back on our future session. And uh, next time we will try to have a more interactive session with the audience uh, so they get to learn from you one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, I wholeheartedly thank all the organizers uh, for this session, uh, the conference chair, the convener, all the uh, guest speaker, resource person, participants, and uh, the master of the conference. Thank you so much uh, for doing this wonderful session and sharing all the important information. For participants who are joining us on the YouTube, uh, we will start sharp at 2 p.m. Uh, I have shared the link for the session too on the WhatsApp groups as well as in the YouTube chat. I request you all to please visit the link and uh, set a reminder so that you don't miss when we go live. I will also share the link once again shortly in all the WhatsApp groups. Please make sure that you have joined the WhatsApp groups and please set the reminder. Again, uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for your time, for your patience and sharing all the wonderful activities. Uh, we will end this meeting now. Uh, but before that, uh, if possible, I request you all to please turn on your cameras once so that we can take a snapshot uh, as a memory. Uh, Yogesh sir, please, if possible, can you turn on the camera? Uh, Shridhara sir, please turn on your camera. Professor Malyadri, uh, if you are there, please, can you turn on your camera? Uh, there is some problem with the camera, sir. Please go on. No worries, no worries. Uh, Malyadri sir, are you there? Uh, please go ahead, Amaya. Yogesh. Go ahead, go ahead, Amaya. Okay, sir. Okay. All done. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a great day ahead. Thanks a lot.